Welcome to the Market Huddle with Patrick the Content Machine Serezna and Kevin the Macro Tourist Muir. So grab a drink, get comfortable, and get ready for a deep dive into the markets. Take it away, guys. August 2nd, 2019, episode 39. I'm Patrick Sorosna. And I'm Kevin Muir. Thanks for joining us this week. Today we are joined by Jared Dillian from Daily Dirt Nap and with a special return appearance by Pinecone Macros' Chase Taylor. For our WTF segment, Mike Novogratz tells us where Bitcoin is headed. And then uh, this week we're going to get into the trading history, looking back to the market closure during World War I. And then uh, we're going to get to the top five things to watch next week. Okay, Lena, hop on. Let's talk beers. What do we got this week? So this week we're sponsored by Collective Arts Brewing Company's Jam Up the Mash Dry Hopped Sour. So it's a beer for Patrick. Mm. <laughs> um, so after the never-ending battle between the hopheads and sour lovers, we decided to appease the two using Nelson. Okay, I'm going to chop up the um, pronunciation here. Nelson Savine from New Zealand and Citra from Pacific Northwest. This mixed fermentation brew is juicy, sour, and extremely refreshing. Sour and ho- sour and hops in perfect thirst quenching melody. All sounds right. Ter- it, it sounds terrible, Patrick. Okay, that's <laughs> You're I, judging I'm, I'm before you even try it. <laughs> I am. I am. Oh my God. It's Holy actually really shit. nice. It's really oh, nice. Okay, make I knew sure you. Make sure you tune in later to see how low a rating I give it. <laughs> but okay. it's cool, the artwork on the cans, right? Like, I think they Each have... can has a different set of artwork, yeah. yeah. And of this course, is... Ke- Kevin has the one with, uh, with the devil demon on it. <laughs> yeah. Very fitting. I, I got some, like, <laughs> robot guy. I don't know. It's weird. Anyway. Okay. Uh, so let, g- give us your uh, legal stuff. Yeah. Clients and employees of East West Investment Management may hold positions and securities mentioned in this podcast. Nothing in this podcast should be viewed as investment advice. Listeners should consult an investment professional before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned in this show. For more information, please visit eastwestfunds.com. Side effects of too much market huddle may include water elf disease, Saturday night palsy, and or crazy for Swayze. (laughs) (sighs) All right. Crazy for Swayze. Okay, let's get Jared online here. All right, so joining us now is Jared Dillian. Jared, welcome to the show. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, listen, so uh, we, we always invite our guests on to uh, tell us what's on their mind, what's their favorite thing going on in the markets that they want to talk about. So uh, what did you, uh, what's, what's the biggest thing that you think is going on in the markets right now, one of your bigger themes that you want to discuss? Man, what do you think is on my mind? It's like the bond market exploding higher, carrying out shorts on a stretcher. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) That's exactly um, what's going on. That's what's going on. So listen, let's, uh, before we talk about like the trading and the macro aspect of this, uh, let's, you know, let's think about this from the aspect of a retail investor. And, you know, what is the ideal portfolio and how do people arrive at that? You know, most people are like 80, 20, 70, 30, but they don't really put a lot of thought into it. Uh, you know, I took a survey and 45% of people have zero to 20% bonds in their portfolio. Um, and why not? Because stocks have gone up for like 11 years and people don't really think too much about a bond allocation. And honestly, a lot of retail investors don't understand bonds. And you have this dynamic where financial advisors, you know, if they underperform, uh, they get in trouble and they get fired. So there's this, uh, there's this, a lot of pressure, a lot of institutional pressure to keep people fully invested in equities. And when people look at bonds, they really think of them as a waste of time, especially you know now with tens around one eight. Like why, why would a, why would I buy a ten year note at one eight? Why would I buy uh, a thirty year bond at two four? And there's you know there's pretty good reasons because you know once you get yields down to these levels, bonds really cross over from an income security into almost like an equity-like security. It's not equity, but it's it has different characteristics. Uh, and a lot of people don't understand the math behind that. Um, 
you know, if you've never taken a bond math class or really studied it, you know, a lot of people think interest rates will go to zero and stop. Uh, or they think that bond prices go up linearly, but they don't understand convexity and they don't understand that bond prices can go almost parabolic the lower the yields go. And, you know, it's it, bonds. Here's, here's the thing I don't understand about people like uh, they have these portfolios with 100 percent equities and they're willing to invest in equities that are overvalued. But they are not willing to invest in bonds that are overvalued. They'll invest in overvalued stocks, but they won't invest in overvalued bonds. And you add bonds to your portfolio because they have risk diminishing characteristics. If you had a 35, 65 portfolio, and by the way, that's the portfolio that the risk parity guys use, you have about two thirds of the return with half the risk. Two thirds of the return with half the risk. That is the portfolio that has the highest sharp ratio. You can tweak it even more. If you have a portfolio that's 35% bonds, 55% stocks, 3% commodities, 3% gold, and 4% REITs over the last 20 years, going back to 1999, that portfolio has the same return as an 80-20 portfolio with half the risk. So right. people, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, right. I mean, that's, uh, that's definitely been the case going backwards for sure. Uh, yeah, Jerry, let's cap here. One second, I did a quick question for you. That's because we've had a situation where bonds and stocks have been negatively correlated. Do you worry about that correlation breaking down? Yeah, absolutely. I worry about it all the time. I mean, it actually kind of keeps me up at night because once that correlation breaks down, then it, then you know, the, then you have this big regime change and bonds no longer reduce the risk in your portfolio. Uh, so then you have to start thinking about other asset classes. Like my guess is that uh, stock bond correlation will become positive when inflation picks up. And then you have to start looking at assets like commodities and real estate and stuff like that. Uh, but for the time being, you know, that negative correlation exists and you still have to have it in your portfolio. Okay. So, so Jared, where, where are we going though? I mean, are you in that camp where uh, interest rates are gravitating towards zero or even negative in, in the United States? I think they're gravitating towards zero or negative globally. And, and, and honestly, I, you know, I don't want to be too crude about it, but the biggest reason is Donald Trump. Absolutely. I mean, it, if Trump wanted stocks higher, he got stocks higher. Trump wanted interest rates lower, he got interest rates lower. The only thing he hasn't gotten his way on is the dollar, which is higher. But, you know, Trump has intervened at the Fed over and over and over again. This rate cut was directly attributable to Trump. They'll get more rate cuts. The whole yield curve will come down. Hopefully it'll steepen. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is, he is affecting, this is a force that is affecting interest rates globally. You know, I saw the other day that the Austrian hundred year is trading under 1% now and everybody's like, oh, that's terrible. You know, I mean, I'm like, I would buy it. Like I would absolutely buy it. So. Yeah, but you're buying it as a trader though, right? Because it's not a, you can't really justify a buy and hold for the long term on that Austrian bond. I mean, you're just talking about the convexity and the fact that with the interest rates structurally going lower, you're still going to get more juice out of that uh, century bond, right? Yeah, I mean, but a lot of people, they sort of get more, they get morally indignant about it. You know, it's like a, it's like a moral thing. Like, ah, oh, like I can't, I can't buy a hundred year bond with a 1% yield. It's just wrong. Like, it doesn't matter if it's wrong. Like it's, that sounds like someone I do a podcast with. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's just, it's, it's going to go up. So, I mean, look, and, and I, it, you know, I'm pretty strident about this uh, duration call, this lower interest rate call. I have been for a while. I have been since three and a quarter and tens, uh, but I think it still continues to work. And, you know, if you want to talk about inflation, there's still no inflation. I mean, all the macro stuff is there. So, um, you know, I mean, from my standpoint, I'm not, you know, to me, it's not like a fast money trade. Uh, uh, you know, I've just tilted my portfolio heavily towards bonds, uh, changed the asset allocation, and uh, it, it's it's worked out. So, okay, so the, now 
obviously many of our listeners are thinking, well, listen, why don't I follow the suit? We're going to buy bonds. We're all going to hold hands and sing Kumbaya. But the thing is, is, is that how does this play out, though? I mean, let's say we're going to we're, the, the, uh, the common narrative is we're about to see an economic recession. And we're going to, uh, at some point, see the Fed have to go through a rate cut cycle. And uh, there, so we're going to see um, a number of these uh, cuts coming in. They're going to bring interest rates to zero on the front end. But how, uh, and, that, and there's, we're going to see this whole thing pull back. And there's an opportunity to keep profiting from bonds. I love that story. I made that pitch. Kevin didn't like it so much. But, uh, but that, that scenario I could see. But how long does this play out? I mean, is this bond story like a one to three year duration thing for you? Or do you still think that we're, we're going to see this even for the next like half a decade or decade that, that bonds are going to continue to work? I mean, it's hard to say. I mean, you know, I, I think if you asked a lot of people uh, if bonds are currently in a bubble, they might say yes. Uh, I don't think they're in a bubble, but I think they will be in a bubble. And if you remember the George Soros quote, you know, when Soros, when he ever saw a bubble forming, he would get in there and make it bigger, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, the, you know, the question is, if this is a bubble or a bull market, what year is it? Is it 97? Is it 98? Is it 99? Is it 2000? If it's 97, and we have, you know, we have three more years. Uh, you know, I don't really, I don't really have a, a real strong view. I can't, I just, you know, I can't look out that far as to whether this is this big secular thing. We're going to have 10, 20 years of negative interest rates. Uh, but, you know, if it's 97, there's a lot of money to be made. You know what? <coughs> you know, Kev, I have to say that Jared's a really smart man. The, yeah. You know, yeah, you, you two should, uh, you guys should go out and just like uh, hold hands. But listen, you guys have been right, and so hats off to you because it's continued to go that way. I, I, I worry about it, but I, you know, when you get something this overbought, but I kind of respect uh, Jared's, you know, standing in there and saying, nope, it's still it's overbought, but it's probably going to still head higher. I've never thought about the fact uh, that maybe retail is more under exposed to this asset class than I thought. It's actually yeah, a great I insight. Yeah, it's actually. I think. I think retail is massively, massively underexposed to fixed income. Uh, you know, if if you if you look at uh, uh, target date funds, these uh, balance funds. If you know what a target date fund is, you know, if you look at if you look at like a like a twenty sixty target date fund, it's ninety percent stocks. If you go to a robo advisor and ask them for a conservative portfolio, they give you 86% stocks. My mom has her account at Edward Jones. This is a true story. The advisor comes up to me and he says, we need to diversify your mother into aggressive growth stocks. She's a 73 year old lady. The world, the world is just absolutely choked on stocks. So, I mean, yeah. Do you ever worry, though, that what they've done is gone into a kind of uh, bond surrogates in the stock market, like the XLU and a lot of the kind of, you know, interest rate sensitive stocks might be overpriced? Like, do you worry that that might be where the bubble is? Uh, I don't know. That stuff is pretty small. I mean, if you look at the assets of like IYR and XLU and all the re ETFs and stuff like that, it's not that big. So I don't think so. So what would give you pause that you would say, you know, maybe I'm wrong? Like, what would be the signs? Like you said, if you saw inflation, um, what would be like, wouldn't it be a situation where by the time we saw inflation, the bond market would already kind of backed up? Uh, do you, ever, do you worry yeah, about I, that? I don't know if inflation is going to be the catalyst. I mean, the FOMC meeting was pretty, it was super interesting. Uh, it, the, one, the one important takeaway from the FOMC meeting was that the yield curve, two tens, flattened seven basis points and by the way the yield curve is not supposed to flatten when the fed cuts rates that's not supposed to happen for sure or, it means they didn't they means they didn't uh, um, loosen as much as the market was expecting yeah that's that's absolutely yeah. what it means and, and implicitly it means that trump is right now i'm not saying he's right to like take away the fed's independence but in terms of his view on interest rates he's absolutely correct so if he's correct and the curve needs to steepen and the front end needs to come down, then it probably means we're going into recession. Uh, and, you know, I see, like, I'm not worried about upside in yields at all in this environment. 
Mm-hmm. So if they had if they done fifty, would you have been less inclined to buy the bond market? Like, would that be like I saw a guy on Bloomberg this morning, and one of one of the big kind of bond managers, and his whole argument was, I I like bonds because the Fed isn't lowering rates quickly enough, and therefore it's not inflationary. So therefore they're going to be behind the curve, and we're going to get a continued flattening, and therefore I got to own the long end. Would you be worried if the Fed did come out and did fifty and said, "By the way, we're also going to do QE"? Like, what point would what point would that scare you when they're easing too much? Uh, I mean, you just have to watch the price action. I mean, if if the curve steepened dramatically and it was actually like a twist, uh, and, and and the back end really sold off hard, then yeah, that would be an inflation trade, and you'd start to worry about duration. But we're just like, well, there's been zero sign of that at all. So. So you're just watching the price action. And you're saying this price action looks like it's headed a lot higher. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and so one of the things you also mentioned is commodities. So is there good specific commodities that you like or that you would include in your portfolio? And what do you what would you put in if you did start to see an uptick in inflation and you know you wanted something to diversify your portfolio? Uh, I mean, I don't mean to be like a metals bug. Uh, you know, I, I think you know energy is a bit of a disaster. Ags are a bit of a disaster. You know, uh, I own an ETF that's a commodities basket, and I'm unhappy with it. I mean, honestly, if you want commodities exposure, I think you should just stick to metals, uh, precious metals and base metals. And, you know, I mean, even this. see, here's the thing with precious metals that a lot of people don't understand. People say, well, gold's, you know, gold's a terrible hedge against inflation. Well, gold doesn't really trade off inflation. Gold trades off the fear of inflation. Right. So if people are worried about inflation, then people buy gold. And that's what happened from 09 to 11. Uh, but we never got inflation. So it's really when people fear inflation. So when you see massive deficits that are going to have to get monetized, when you see people talking about MMT and people fear that sort of currency debasement type of inflation, that's when gold performs well. So. All right. So, oh, but for sense. now, you don't see any signs of that. This isn't enough. And so even though we're getting a situation where there's fiscal deficits, you're just looking at the price action. You're saying it, it, we're not there. So there's no point in, in owning those commodities. No, no, I'm not saying that at all. I mean, I think that, you know, I think that 10% of a portfolio should be commodities. And at this point in time, it should be metals. And the price action is pretty good. I mean, we're nowhere near like any kind of panic about uh, inflation or currency debasement. That's very far off. But, the, you know. Gold's up from 1050 to 1430, you know, off the lows. Like that's, you know, it's where I, I would, I would call this the beginning of a bull market. So, yeah. So one of the things you mentioned actually is you said that Trump got his way with the fed. The, he got his way with the stock market. The only thing he hasn't got his way with is the dollar. I completely agree. And, and one of my big themes that come kind of going forward here is that I think is not, it's only gonna be a matter of time before he starts to talk down the dollar. And in fact, I'm worried he's going to do even more than talk down the dollar. Yeah. I'm worried he's actually going to do direct intervention. Yeah. And I was just wondering about your thoughts about that. Will he get the third, you know, the third pillar of his kind of, he gets the stock market, he gets the bond market and will he get the, the dollar? Yeah, it's a good question. And actually, that's that's kind of being talked about on trading desk. People are sort of anticipating the, uh, you know, the idea that we'll be doing current, currency intervention someday. I mean, there was a reporter that asked Larry Kudlow, point blank, do we have a strong dollar policy? And you know what his answer was? He said, well, we're not doing currency interventions, are we? So that's I guess, I guess that's the you know, that's the definition of a strong dollar policy these days. We're not doing currency intervention. Right. Uh, but don't you so. but but Jerry, don't you think that Cudlow's out of the loop? And let's face it, does does Trump listen to anyone? Like I, I don't, I don't buy that he listens to anyone, and I think that one day uh, he's going to figure out that he can, he can actually sell dollars, and he's going to write, he's going to pull out the pink tickets. That's what I'm worried about. I think it's going to happen. I think this guy, if there's one thing that you've learned from Trump, is to never underestimate the, the, how much he's willing to do things that haven't been done before. Yeah, I hundred percent agree. And you know, uh, I don't think Cudlow really has any influence over it. Uh, by the way, I want to say like. You know, the timing of this podcast is pretty special. Uh, it's, you know, it's being recorded like after this massive bond rally. And it, sound, it, it sounds like a, to- like a huge victory lap on my part. And I probably sound like a complete jackass. You know, I just, I just want to say like, <laughs> uh, like I'm a trader. I could get housed tomorrow. 
right? And, you know, we all have to have some humility, and I do have humility, and the trade has worked, and I like to talk about it. But gee whiz, you know, like, I, you know, a lot of luck is involved, and, I, and I'm just, you know, grateful that it's worked out, so. So, so what's your call here? I mean, Powell comes out and basically get, get, literally said that this is a mid-cycle adjustment and that it, giving the market the impression that this is a one and done. Is that a joke or, that, or that, is? Well, I, Powell, I think Powell actually believes that to be true. Uh, I, I think he genuinely believes that. I think, I think that Powell is going to lose his job. I think Trump is going to get rid of him uh, because they're just they're going to come to an impasse here. Um, and, uh, you, you know, the, the only way for Trump to get his way is, is to just get rid of Powell. So, uh, I guess I could make that call. I could say that's going to happen. Um, yeah. So I, they like move in I like it a lot, actually. I saw a guy on uh, one of my trader feed guys. You know, I get my Bloomberg chats, and he was taking markets, his predictions on what were the chances that Powell's um, key card was going to work the next day. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I don't disagree with you at all. I think the market's probably underestimating the possibility that, he, that uh, Trump gets rid of him. Quick question for you. What do you think happens if tomorrow he says uh, Trump is, dem- I mean, sorry, Powell is demoted? And because I don't think he can fire him. I believe that all he can do is make him no longer the chair. That's correct. I'm not a hundred percent sure. Okay. So what do you think happens, Jared? I'm going to put you on the spot here. What do you think happens if tomorrow he says he's no longer the chair? I have put Neil Kashkari in charge of the whole thing and uh, deal with it. What do you think the market does? The bond market, stock market and, and dollar. Uh, that, that's probably 4% down in the S and P it's probably three full handles in the long bond. Uh, it's probably, up? you mean up like up? Yeah. Up. Yeah. Um, and the curve flattens like it goes, like it goes inverted. Yeah, probably. Well, actually, actually, no, it would probably bull Steven. It would probably bull Steven and gold would be up for your 50 for sure. Yeah. So you think S and P would be down that much though? I really do. Yeah, I do. I think, I think I can just, see that. You what just because you you think that the crisis and confidence of the fact that you have yeah. a president doing something so dramatic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, okay, next question: What happens a week later? Uh, I don't know. Uh, gee whiz, I can't. I mean, like, does the stock even... market does the stock market take it as good news, and do we end up higher after the initial sell off? Is what I guess what I'm asking. Ah. Uh... I don't know. It probably it probably depends on who the replacement Fed chair would be. I mean, it would it could be Cash Carey, could be Bullard, uh, could be Judy Shelton if she ends up on the board of governors. It would be it would oh be a dog. Yeah. Yeah. If it was Judy Sheldon, geez, I can't imagine that. Okay. Well, anyways, listen for um, Jared. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. So why don't you tell people a little bit about yourself? What like what you do? You write a great letter. Uh, you know, it's one of the letters that I've I, I, I subscribed to way back way in the day, and uh, it's always a must read. So why don't people tell people about that, and also tell them about your new venture? You have uh, you've given up podcasting and gone to back to old school radio. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So my full time job is I'm a publisher of the Daily Dirt Nap, which is a macro newsletter. Uh, and you should check it out. I'm at www.dailydirtnap.com. It's been around for 11 years, which is kind of a long time for uh, a newsletter. Um, still going. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at Daily Dirt Nap. And yeah, the new thing is, uh, you know, I, I did the podcast for a couple of years. Uh, it was successful. had a good time with it. Uh, I've shifted a little more towards personal finance. I'm starting the Jared Dillion Show. Uh, it's going to be on terrestrial radio on FM. It's actually, uh, we're still hammering out some final things, but it's supposed to start on Monday. And I think I'm going to start in Chicago and Las Vegas. Uh, but it's both, we're going to expand it to many, many other stations. Uh, and, you know, and the goal is to sort of compete with uh, Dave Ramsey uh, and take a bite out of his business. So. Well, that's, that's great. You're doing going old school, going back a contrarian, going to the old FM radios. I love it. So yeah. make sure you guys all go check out Jared on Twitter and the daily Thanks for being with us. And J- Jared, before we let you go, it's time for, uh, you know, that time, the tales from the trading desk. And I believe you are uh, an old hand and used to sit on the desk at uh, Lehman and did basically what I did. You were index arb trader, if I remember correct, an ETF trader. I'm sure you have a couple of good tales for us, or at least one. Why don't you share us with uh, share share something with us in terms of uh, your days from uh, Wall Street way back when? Yeah, I have, a, I have a short one, but it's one of these things. It's like 
it's, 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 you know, every time I tell this joke, people don't really, it's not a joke. Every time I tell the story, people don't really laugh. They're like, huh? And it's like, you know, you kind of, you kind of had to be there. Uh, I was, I was, uh, running the ETF desk and, uh, uh, I, you know, one of the ETFs we traded was XLE. So this this uh, account comes in and he says, where can I sell 500,000 XLE? And I said, 72 cents. And he said, where can I sell 250,000 XLE? And I said, 74 cents. So he says, sell 250 XLE at 74. And I said, I buy. So I bought 250 XLE. Two, sec- two seconds later, he says, how are you on 250 more XLE? I said 74. He said sold. <laughs> so, I, so I so I so I stand up and I'm furious. I stand up on the trading floor and I'm like, that's like stuffing five pounds of shit in a ten pound bag. <laughs> I mean the other way around. <laughs> So yeah, that's, that's my story. You know what? People people uh, don't appreciate that. I remember one time uh, I was on the desk and someone came and asked me for a bid for a million uh, tips. We ours are much lower price, so that wasn't as big a trade probably as your five hundred uh, XLE. But it's, they asked me for a bid, and tips was our Toronto thirty five product. And he, I bid him, and he plugged me, and I owned the million. And then all of a sudden, over the hoot and holler, because it's coming out of Montreal, I get, oh, Kevin, where you bid for another million? And I was like, are you shitting me? And what I guess non-institutional traders don't understand is that it's, it's, not, it's not good form to, you know, not hit yeah. someone with the not, full you, amount. You got you to you show your whole size, yeah. That's right. You can't yeah. do that, right? And so, the, like, everyone was like, oh, for me, they were all like, oh, geez, what's going to go on? Kev's going to be so mad. And I said to the, I said to the sales trader, I said, listen, you got to, you got to let, you got to make sure I trade that next million. And I proceeded to sell it hard so that I could buy it into the hole and like stuff yeah. them on the next million is what I did. So, but these are kind of the things that on a trading desk and, and I don't even know, do you think these kind of things happen anymore? Does anybody trade that way or are they all just doing no. VWAPs? No, no, it's all, it's all VWAP. It's, it's uh, there's no risk transfer. Uh, you know, like, you know, we used to, you know, I, 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 you know, I don't want to brag, but like some of the biggest trades we did were like three, four, 500 million, like on a touch, like risk transfer, like in an equity product. I mean, it was massive amounts of risk. You know, I mean, just that does not, it does not happen these days. So I know they've ruined the game, Jared. They've ruined the game. <laughs> yeah. We should go, you and I should go back and just uh, start trading ETFs back and forth. Listen, we would just be sitting around waiting for the phone ring, would, to ring because nobody would be calling us because they'd all be sticking in VWAPs. Yeah. They'd all want to because they all want to bench against VWAP, and they wouldn't. And no trader on a buy side would have the balls to actually take a view midday. Yeah. Anyways, thanks for that story, Jared. And for those who want to hear more for Jared, make sure you check out the end where we're going to go into after hours, and I'm sure we'll get more stories of his days at Lehman. Thanks again, Jared. Thanks. Okay, joining us now is a second uh, kind of appearance from Chase Taylor from Pinecone Macro. I got him on because he's. Uh, He's feeling the pain from his positions, just like me. Uh, Chase, good to have you on, buddy. Uh, it's great to be on. Yeah, not not the <laughs> funnest day out there today. No, it's not, is it? <laughs> um, we were just kind of laughing about it because Jared and uh, Patrick were having their victory lap from all their kind of long bond positions, and I think we're a little bit more inclined to be on the, the short side of it. And yet the bond market's screaming in our face. What do you think's happening here? What, what's your interpretation of the uh, what's kind of coming down with Powell and Trump? Yeah, so um, I, I thought yesterday went went OK for bonds, considering everything that happened. So I was I actually wasn't feeling too bad about being short. Um, but then obviously today with the, the tariff bond that kind of just blew everything out of the water. Uh, I, I actually got stopped out of everything I was I was doing in futures uh, bond wise and. I've I've been you know a dollar bull for a long time and was long uh, against a few pairs so those really saved me from just getting annihilated today. But I I know I've seen a lot of people speculating that this is just you know a big Trump ploy to to get the Fed to to do his bidding and I, I'm not saying that's completely you know out of bounds but I, I don't buy into it as much as others. So oh, what do so you think that this is actually? an escalation that's going to last and that is, is serious that we should be taking as uh, something that's going to be, that's going to stick. Is that what you're thinking? 
I don't even know if I think it's going to stick. I, I just don't think the timing was quite as, you know, as conspiratorial as everyone thinks that, oh, it's just because Powell didn't cut 50 basis points because the reality was, you know, his team came in and briefed him on on the trip to China and how that went. And then right after that, he decided to do this. Um, I I will say, though, I I never really I like the he, conspiracy he would go theory. there for this. Yeah, no, it, it's not like it doesn't make sense. I, I see why people think that uh, it's, you know, it's probably convenient for Trump both ways. But right. I would I, I would agree with you there, Chase. But the, you're, you're right that the reality is that they just got back. So he would have just been briefed and he's like, OK, screw you. We're going to go to we're going to do this. We're going to pick it up a notch. Right. Yeah. Here's the thought I have for you, Chase. You, you mentioned your dollar bull. Um, I'm actually become the other way. I'm a little bit of a dollar bear. One of the things that I worry about is that Trump is going to figure out that he's actually can control, tell the Treasury to sell dollars. What is your thinking? What's why are you a dollar bull? And are you worried about Trump maybe coming in and actually using his power to intervene in the currency market? Yeah, I, I think anyone that's bullish has to really keep an eye on that. Uh, from everything I've read, though, the you know the Treasury's actual firepower to do anything, at least you know as it stands right now, just is limited. They, there's not that much they can do. Not not enough to move a market that big. So. I do worry about it from just a, a narrative standpoint, a sentiment standpoint, but not. not so, you, so what? Why don't you? Why don't you share with us that? So you've you've read, and they, there's a limited amount that they can sell. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, just just kind of if you just read read through, and I can't remember verbatim, but like the the essential tool tool set set they have that they that they use to actually devalue is is pretty limited. They would. From my understanding, there'd have to be some statutory changes, which, you know, there's the new bill in Congress. So maybe maybe something does come down, you know, from the government. But I, but yeah, I thought I that they could go the, in. The and they, it was like a few I, billion dollars. That they would right. So like the around. reality. So they can go sell the, like a certain amount of dollars and then they would actually have to go change the law. Is that what you're saying? And therefore that few billion won't be enough to actually move the market. Is that kind of your argument? Yeah. So you're not that worried about it? Exactly. And, and, you know, what, one of the things that, and honestly, the dollar worries me just in general, even though I've been bullish, I get, it's worrisome because it has refused to go down and it's had, you know, a million reasons to go down lately. You look at, you know, the debt ceiling and, and the, the treasury running down their cash balance and that, that really didn't even move the dollar. And then, you know, as soon as they, as soon as they kind of got the debt ceiling situation resolved, I mean, it just took off and, and you know, right in the, right in the face of, you know, rate cuts and ending QT, like all, all the things that dollar bulls or dollar bears were saying we're going to kill the dollar. They've kind of all come to pass and, and the dollar still, you know, it's made new highs yesterday and did it again today before. It okay. Back so, down. so Chase, I have to ask you though, how much do you think it has to play with the, uh, the late cycle dynamics, which is that traditionally in the past when we've gone through a business cycle and, and the world goes to shit and then we go into a recession, that uh, the safe haven trade is to go into the dollar. And with the global economic slowdown, I mean, there's headlines like that we're already in an, uh, you know, an earnings, uh, corporate earnings recession, but we we're already seeing a manufacturing recession on, uh, globally. And everyone sees the writing on the wall. They're using the dollar as a safe haven. I mean, is that is that really maybe the catalyst what's happening here? Is it just that uh, everyone's looking at history and, and saying there's no better place to be at this stage in the cycle yeah i I definitely think that adds to it and uh a lot of times if china if a if a global cycle is kind of led down by china the way this one in my opinion has been that that tends to lead to even more dollar outperformance than than when it's otherwise so as long as china's kind of sitting back and, and not really stimulating much you know the rest of the global economy comes down everyone will blame all that on trade but i think i think most of it's just the basic business cycle of China and the fact that they haven't, you know, just poured stimulus everywhere. But yeah, you know, just getting a normal cyclical slowdown domestically and globally, bo- both, you know, I think would lead to inflows into the dollar. So, so I, do you I think, think do you worry of... about this getting a lot worse, Chase? Like, are, are you worried about a global economic uh, 
like uh, on Real Vision, we were in Recession Watch, and there's like nine guys on on Real Vision talking about all the the different recession chances. And listen, maybe they're right, um, but I just kind of, to me, I I worry whenever I see that many people arguing that it's that we're they're due for a recession. That the reality is that very few times is that actually predicted in advance. Right. What is your thoughts there? Like, what, where do you see the the global economy headed? So I, I don't think it's bottom yet. I think I think there's more weak data to come, specifically in the U.S. Like I, also, I don't think it's bottom quite yet. Uh, but at the same time, my my thought process for the last, you know, say three months has been we're not going to go into a recession. And, you know, all these we're going to cut, you know, 100, 150 basis points uh, predictions that everyone's made and everyone's, you know, huddling up in, in euro dollars. I, I, I thought that was that was wrong. I, I've thought. We're going to get one, maybe two cuts, and at worst, we're going to get a very shallow, very quick recession. But I will say, w- watching the dollar move higher, the way it did yesterday, and in, in the face of a lot of, you know, a lot of reasons for it to go down, it's starting to make me think the dollar could be what what makes this whole thing worse, and what maybe does tip us over into a recession, especially with, you know, the trade war getting getting a little worse. E- even though I don't think. The trade war in actuality is as bad as everyone fears. That doesn't mean it won't push over sentiment and, and mess with you know business confidence. And you, you could argue the U.S. consumer is kind of holding the whole world up at the moment. And if they kind of fall apart, then then yeah, it we'll, we'll have a lot bigger problem than, than those of us that have kind of argued for maybe one or two cuts only are, are, have been thinking. So, so you think there's still more pain to come in Europe and in China? Like going, like we're we're not at the the trough yet in terms of the bottom. And as far as like a lot of like manufacturing and survey data, like I, I think some of that is still has a ways to go. But if, you know, you, you look at the M1 chart at, in China, and it looks like it could have bottomed. Uh, some of the leading indicators out of Europe actually look decent. So, and even in the U.S., there's some leading data a little bit further out that looks like it you know could be picking up a little bit. So, there there's actually to me a good bit of red meat out there for people looking for a bottom in the third quarter maybe fourth quarter and then you know this gets ripping higher so you know if if trump gets another rate cut you know qt is over if the labor market's still holding on reasonably strong in six months or four months whatever from now you know you you just cut really hard into a pretty tight economy i i think you know, the, there's there's the opportunity for the Fed to make a policy mistake in either direction right now. And that's something I don't think people on either side appreciate is we're kind of like on a, on a delicate balance where the Fed could go too loose or or too tight, uh, you know, in the next six months because everything's kind of weird right now. They're, the reaction function is, isn't what it usually is. They're having to look, you know, more to the global economy, more to the to the dollar and more to you know, trying to maintain their credibility on 2% inflation. So they're, they're kind of in uncharted territory. They're used to looking at the unemployment rate and inflation. That's about it. Right now, they're kind of having to, to juggle politics and, you know, a trade war. So the the room for them to make a mistake either, in either direction is significant. And what do you think the best way to express that kind of uh, uncertainty is? Well, like in terms of I, from a financial perspective, in terms of a trade. Yeah. So I thought, you know, being short bonds was going to be a decent way to do it until about today. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Chase, man, you, you got to hang tough, so, buddy. You got to hang tough. We're oh, no. Look, look, you look, know I'll, what? I'll, Come on. No, a good I'll, trader I'll, knows I'll, when I'll, to I'll, walk away, Kev. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, had my st- I had my top stike, my uh, <laughs> stops tight going into to yesterday for that reason and barely survived. And then it started looking looking, looking a little better, you know, and, and then today the, the tape bomb just blew everything up. But I was happy that, that my stops were tightened up after after today, that's for sure. So what anyway, so you, what was your what's your favorite way going forward? Like, what are you looking at? What do you think might be a way to express like if, if what you think is correct, that there is more risk that the economy comes out of this quicker than we expect and, and the, the inflation guys are or sorry, the ref, the recession guys are wrong. What is the best kind of risk reward trade out there that you see? Yeah, I, I think, you know, you, you and I have talked about tips in the past. I talked about it last time I was on the show. I, I still think tips are a good place because. You know, last time I was on the show, I said, you know, if that inflation was surprise higher, which we're not really getting, 
but I still thought the economy would slow down. So at least, you know, you were in fixed income. It would get, it would get some love there. So I still think that can work. And if, you know, we stabilize in the next couple of weeks, just, I, I really think getting short treasuries again could work, but you, you have to, you have to wait until the price action tells you to do that. But at the same time, if the fed is loosening really hard and it turns out everyone's wrong, I mean, I don't, I don't see why just owning us equities isn't going to work out, especially if the dollar keeps moving higher and, and really, you know, puts a lot of pre- downward pressure on on the rest of the world. Right. You could so the blow off top that we're looking at for that we've been talking about. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you you'd have the liquidity liquidity conditions, the capital flows conditions, you know, all kind of set there. And and if especially if fixed income starts starts to back up, people might get nervous, you know, and just all right. start moving in Chase. equities. Chase, Chase, okay, so stop for a second, though, because s and P's first reaction for uh, 48 hours or the last couple trading sessions here has been uh, wiping out about, let's say, let's round it to 70 S&P points in very short order. And sure. uh, do you think, though, that we first go through some sort of a more meaningful market correction before that kind of a scenario emerges? Or, or do you think that this is just going to be a quick little blip in the radar and then it's back to the upside? Yeah. So at the moment, I could easily see it being a little bit more serious correction than it is currently, just because, you know, I, I think the market's able to to digest stuff when it comes a little bit at a time. But a lot got thrown on the market in the last couple of days. You, you have, you know, the Fed chair talking about mid cycle and then Trump's really up in the ante on the trade war. You know, North Korea is launching more missiles. It, it, it's been a, you know, it's been a crazy couple of days. So I think you might have to get some digestion, you know, VIX is still under 20. You might need to see, you might need to see the VIX pop up near 30 or something, get, get money flowing back out. Uh, I was, I was long stocks until recently, but you know, you start looking at fund fund managers all started piling back in and everyone got optimistic again and, you know, yeah. being a good contrarian, that's when I stepped aside. And, but now, you know, if everyone starts running for the Hills again, that's, you know, that's when you start looking for a, a good level to get back in. Well, not only right. that, with bonds rallying so hard, like there's going to be the Tina's going to be back. Like, Absolutely. Let's, let, <laughs> like I, I know that's like uh, she's not very nice, and it's, it's and she kind of screams at your house late at night and stuff. But like <laughs> Tina is real, and she's yeah. there, and there is no other term. Oh alternative. come on! And, and, uh, in our uh, upside you, down rule, that's where you have to go for yield. So okay, yeah. so the, okay, <laughs> the short end, oh, the short end of the curve, though. Uh, uh, is all yeah, about yeah. Powell. You're not. You're not. You're, Tina's going to be there for short-term uh, deposits. You know, you might lose a little bit on the longer-term bonds, but come on, Tina's going to be there if you want to <laughs> go to cash. Yeah, Tina. I I don't like Tina. I I like the stock market. Uh, <laughs> hey, uh, D- I, I will say one thing, Chase. I I, I might have gutered your trade. I added to my break-evens today. <laughs> I bought him. I bought yeah, the 30s. Get out now. Uh, yeah, it's, you should. You should go. You should be going and telling it. I just looked at this thing, and I think to myself that the reality is that Powell, although he misspoke in terms of indicating his yeah, belief right. that it was going to be a mid spike, uh, 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 kind of, uh, kind of just a correction, he actually doesn't. He's not. He didn't commit to that, and I think the market is overreacting to that because yeah. I think he, that he basically if the data comes he out. <laughs> yeah, and the, and listen, that guy should just stop giving press conferences because I think yeah. now he is ten for twelve that have gone down in terms of the stock market, <laughs> and it just he did no honestly, like he is terrible. He just uh, he should take some lessons from Greenspan, who says if you understand what I said, then you must have I must have misspoke or something. I can't remember what his line <laughs> was. Exactly. It was something like that. Um, but he, he says things in kind of plain English and tells people what he's thinking and, and people take it the wrong way. But the reality is he doesn't know any better than you, me, and even Patrick. Well, like, uh, and even me. <laughs> like that's, the, guy. That's, the, that's the reality of it. And I think that we take way, way, we, we hang on his every word and we, and we jerk around stocks or, or bonds way too much based upon the fact of what he says. But he is, uh, he should just take a lesson uh, from, uh, sorry, go ahead, buddy. Like, I was you, just going to say, go ahead not, and, and it's not just him. I feel like the, the Fed really just in general needs to get their shit together because when you have, I know. when you have Williams talking right before he talks and Williams is like, gives the most batshit crazy, like dovish speech I've ever heard in my life. 
And then like three days later, the Fed chair is talking about being mid cycle and like yeah, yeah. Can you guys? Well, it's like, even worse than out? that because they, because Williams gave the speech and then I think the New York Fed had yeah. to come around right away yeah. and say, oh no no no, that was just theoretical or whatever. Right. They should all just shut up. Like exactly. I, Chase, I saw like I think you're a millennial, so you don't you wouldn't appreciate this. But back in my day, when <laughs> when the Fed did um, kind of changing interest rates. They did it by actually buying or selling uh, T bills in and in, in indicating it. That's way we. That's how we could figure it out. They didn't do a press conference. They didn't even announce it. They just went into the open market and changed the rate. And then everyone had to go. Well, I think they they mean that this is going to now be their new rate. I think I I am one. I should start a petition that we go back to that. Best of luck. No with speeches. That. <laughs> no speeches because I think this is this is bullshit. I actually think their whole like their whole idea. No, honestly, like this is this that is sounds like talk. somebody had lost money today. No, no, that's not true. I did lose money bullshit. today. I won't. It's all I won't, bullshit. I, I won't deny that. But I have long argued this <laughs> that the Federal Reserve, their idea, and, and and that that somehow this forward guidance and communication is a good thing is bullshit. Like I really do believe it's bullshit. <laughs> And I, I had tell some us how really, you really feel, Kevin. No, so I had some really smart guy tell me, <laughs> "Oh no, it's caused inflation to be lower over time." And he sent me some crazy, you know, DSGE economics paper. And I'm sure now I'm going to be inundated with all these economic guys telling me that no, no, this is a good thing. I don't care what they say, uh, you know. And interestingly <laughs> enough, I believe that our central banker, Patrick, yes, Polos, uh, Polos. I think he he was the one who said that he should introduce some uncertainty into the decision. And he has been one of the only central bankers that has actually gone and done a policy that was not more than 50% baked in. Like gone against yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, you never like, see that. Think, so. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. bullshit. If they think they know better then and don't 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 let the market fall like uh, dictate where you should be. Yeah, and if you like, think just, about Powell in December versus Powell now and everything that's happened like he knew nothing in December not to quote <laughs> Kramer there but <laughs> it, he, he knew nothing in December it's like what is the point of forward guidance if you don't if you're if you can't see forward anyways because obviously yeah. they couldn't yeah. yeah and not only that now he's been neutered like uh, yeah. Trump has turned him into like uh, that guy on um on Game of Thrones, that uh, I, I, Ramsey's little guy or whatever. It's just like he's, it, it, it is pathetic. It is absolutely terrible. So if you are neutered, then just admit it and just do whatever Trump says. Like, okay, and, and don't say anything. Just do it. Anyways, we're getting off topic. Let's, let's, let's right. not go there. Um, <laughs> anyway. What else What else do you think, uh, Chase? Like, I, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about MMT because I know you've been writing about it, and I, and I, I think you have some really interesting things to say. What are your thoughts in terms of the longer term kind of changes that we're seeing in our economic kind of, uh, I don't know, I I guess the the epsilon theory guys calls the zeitgeist. Like what do you, what are you seeing there and what do you think the long run opportunities will be? So starting with that last part there, the long run opportunities are are definitely going to be in real assets versus financial assets. I, I think that to me, to me, that's clear. Uh, and uh, Kirill Sokoloff the other day on Real Vision said something that I thought was it perfectly summed up how I feel about just viewing MMT as, as it's coming down. Is he said, you know, everyone's calling all these new policies and stuff socialism. He's like, but he's like, to me, he's like, it's just it's just the cycle, and that's how I see it. Like, this is all just the cycle. This is how this works. This is how this is how politics works. This late in the long term cycle, and this is how economics works. So, yeah, we're 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 out of room when, when it comes to rates. Uh, and that creates tons of room for fiscal policy. It, it creates room, if not in, in some ways a need for actual inflation because inflation is really difficult to create at this point in the cycle with all the debt, but it's not. Impossible. Oh, I love, I love no. what you just said. Thank you. No, no, you know, actually, can, I think can, I, well, well, you shouldn't have interrupted him. Because oh, sorry. Chase, go finish what you're <laughs> no, going to say. Good. Inflation is difficult to create, but, but you know, is, if you go there fiscally, then you then you get it, and and you, you know, it, it, as you've as you've you know made, made clear, to, I think over time is you know Trump's already there. We're already starting it. People always treat MMT as like this thing that 
we're going to get to in five years, maybe when we have a socialist president. But you, you look at the debt ceiling deal, like how much they're adding to the deficit. Uh, you know, China's running a 10, 12 percent fiscal deficit. We're running a 5 percent. And if you if you look at you can, you can actually chart the M1 to M0 ratio like in the U.S. versus versus Europe. And the fact is we're we're able to get money into the hands of spenders instead of just reserves better than Europe. And it's helped the, it's helped the currency and it's helped the economy, whether it was, you know, the, the tax cuts or whatever. The fact is we put money into the real economy better than than Europe. So we've been outgrowing them. We've been getting the capital flows. And I, I just think that's going to continue. That's one of the reasons I am a dollar bull is I, I think the U.S. will beat pretty much everyone else to the punch with implementing MMT. And again, I, we're, in, we're in an expansion right now with trillion dollar deficits. So I, to me, MMT is already here. Yeah, it's in a light version and it's just going to get bigger, but it, it's already happening. And that's why, you know, you and you and I Kev, are on the same page that even cyclical inflation coming up in the next call it year you know, can surprise the upside. I'm not saying we're going to get 3% inflation. I'm just saying higher than all the, all the people expecting, you know, no inflation uh, and, and, you know, bidding bonds back to, back to nothing. So I, so, I think so, M&T so, is inevitable. Uh, it's coming and it's already here. So uh, Chase, you won't say it, but I'll say it. We're getting 3% next year. There you go. Um, Chase, it's been a pleasure having you on. Thank you very much. Why don't you tell us, listen, for anyone that wants to make sure you go listen, you go uh, subscribe to, to Chase's blog and then think hard about uh, get, uh, subscribing and buying his product because it's a terrific product. Really top-notch thinking from uh, Chase. Why don't you tell us where they can find you and your great uh, newsletter? Yeah, Twitter at Pinecone Macro and the website is pinecone-macro.com. And as far as the research goes, there's a, pinecone macro research tab on the website but people can email me or hit me up on twitter and ask for a free sample i'm happy to happy to shoot anyone uh, some some of the stuff great well thanks a lot thanks for joining us today yeah, chase. thanks chase it's been great appreciate having uh, someone in the same kind of mindset as me <laughs> i appreciate yeah, it and chase uh, you're always welcome back on the show if you have any great ideas uh, to share yep sounds good well, thanks for Take coming care, on guys. yeah thanks. cheers thanks again chase Okay, Patrick, it's time for your favorite part of the show, This Week in Trading History. What do you got in store for us? Well, this, uh, this week, uh, we want to go back to the market, uh, market closures during the start of World War I. And so we're going back to July 31st of uh, 1914, when the New York Stock Exchange closes, and more importantly, did not reopen for four and a half months until December 12th of 2014. Can you imagine uh, the markets being closed for four months? What would me and you do? <laughs> no, we have nothing to do. The podcast <laughs> sure would be boring. <laughs> the podcast would be really boring. So let's kind of go through a quick history lesson. So uh, very quickly, um, the um, Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated, and obviously uh, there was a whole bunch of failed diplomatic uh, maneuvering between uh, Austria-Hungary, Germany, France, Russia, and Britain. And obviously, now one second for those millennials in the crowd, Fan Franz Ferdinand is not a band. <laughs> he was actually a historical figure, just so right. you know. And, yeah. and I, I think I pronounced the name right, this show, right? I think, I think you did. Oh, that's awesome. All right, so, <laughs> the, uh, so it, and in the end, what happened was that uh, Russia offered to negotiate uh, rather than demobilize their army, but then Germany declares war on Russia on August 1st. Then they declare, uh, Germany then declares war on France on August uh, 3rd. And, uh, and then uh, when they attack Belgium on August 4th, England declares war on Germany. And then the whole uh, of Europe suddenly is, uh, is in full-on war. And so uh, the impact on the global markets was immediate because that led to actually a closure of every major European exchange. Uh, and, and many of the exchanges outside of Europe, including the New York Stock Exchange. And uh, although no one would have predicted the result at the beginning of July, by the end, the European stock exchanges were making preparations for the inevitable war and its impact. But never before has uh, 
have all of Europe's major exchanges all simultaneously closed. And never such a global um, cataclysm uh, struck the world, right? There, there was market closures in the past during the 1848 revolution in France or the panic in 1873 in New York, but there's never been such a global shutdown of stock markets. And what was uh, the irony of this was what caused this was the openness of the global financial markets before the war, uh, right? And so actually at the beginning of 1914, capital was actually uh, quite free flowing from one country to another without very much hindrance. And so all of these major countries of the world were on a gold standard and the differences in the exchange rates were arbitraged through uh, the buying and selling of international bonds uh, listed on the world stock exchanges. And so uh, a country such as Russia could issue bonds listed on uh, the stock exchanges in London, New York, Paris, Berlin, Amsterdam. Uh, and the differences in the exchange rates between the countries were basically arbitraged by buying or selling of bonds in different markets. And so what really ended up happening is that as these uh, European stock exchanges started to shut down, um, there became a, a big issue or concern that uh, they would, all of the selling would just go overseas and uh, those people that needed that liquidity would basically hammer the New York Stock Exchange. And, and so it was a, a one massive coordinated shutdown. And, uh, and so it, it really interesting that it happened, but it wasn't, what to me was the most interesting was that it happened uh, and lasted so long. Like you would think that after, you know, three, four months, like after even a couple of weeks, they would have kind of structured everything together uh, and got it open again. But the fact that it stayed closed for so long was the part that really captured my attention and, and made me want to kind of bring it up. But what was also interesting was the fact that there became a huge over-the-counter market for these stocks. So while the main exchange was closed, uh, many of the shares kept trading over the counter, right? I didn't and, know that. Yeah. So they just and, kept trading it. Oh. Oh, o OTC, yeah, right. They basically, well, they made their own I don't own think it was actually, is that what they call curbside trading? Like, it wasn't actually over any counter. I think it was, was out on the street, right? Uh, the notes here didn't specify that. So mm -hmm. I, would, I, I could only offer speculation. But what was interesting to me was something like this would make me feel like this would have been a huge market crash, right? Like we were talking about 1893 and then uh, we've talked about 1929 and 1907. And so I would have naturally thought that with a closure like this, that this would have seen a monstrous drop in the markets. But they recreated uh, the the price action that occurred during the market closures through the, the trading of these stocks and uh, over the counter. And really, the Dow Jones dropped from about the 60 level down to about 49, right? Like, it was, it was just like a 20% a drop uh, over, over the month. So, so I, would have, I would have, like, we saw a 20% drop in the markets October through December, right? Like, so, I mean, this was not exactly a crazy market drop. Right. I, I didn't realize that they had actually figured out how much it had dropped kind of theoretically in the yeah. order, like it's And by the way, I, 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 all of the information I'm sharing, I want to give a shout out because uh, I, I, this Brian uh, Taylor uh, from uh, Global Financial Data put this article together. I'm just r r literally referencing everything from the article. So I just wanted to, to make sure that anyone who had wanted to read the whole piece, you can uh, just uh, take a look at uh, just Google uh, businessinsider.com and uh, Brian Taylor, and you can read the whole article on this. But yeah, it was interesting. Uh, I, I just can't imagine a market closure for four months nowadays. I don't think uh, traders would be able to, like, I think people would go insane. Well, and, and the last time we had a market closure for any length of period was actually 9-11. 9-11, and that was for that, like three, four days, right? I think, it wasn't it a little more than that? I can't remember exactly, but it was, uh, and that was mostly just a function of the fact that the lines uh, in New York City had... Uh, had been severed and there was issues with that and in terms of yeah. the settlement as opposed to the, the yeah but the, the, the difference the, the difference there was that new york shut down but uh, this in during world war one was uh, like pretty much the entire global stock market complex was shut well, down yeah, but all european most, exchanges russia but most exchanges. most european countries were you know involved in the war so yeah, true 
true. So, that but, was but it, it certainly did influence the U.S. And that's uh, and that you know it's funny because today we talk about the internet and global interconnectedness, but uh, it was uh, global interconnectedness existed in 1914, right? Like I mean, people were wiring; they had cables going across uh, the ocean, and people were wiring orders from Europe to New York back and forth. Uh, it, there was that kind of capital movement even back then. That's uh, it's pretty cool. I wonder what the latency was on their orders. <laughs> I'm, pr- I'm pretty sure it's not. There was nothing high frequency. I don't. Think. There was nothing measured in milliseconds. I can. No, I don't think so. <laughs> All right. Okay, well, thanks, thanks for, for sharing that with us, Patrick. Yeah. All right, Kev. Time for the WTF clip of the week. What do you have in store for us? Well, Mike Novogratz is at it again. He's uh, busy. Now, don't forget, Mike, uh, you know, we've got to give him a little bit of a shout out. He was when the S&P was at 3000. He said it looked like it was about to explode higher. It was going to be there's no such thing as a triple top. And he was as bullish as all heck. Uh, I'm not sure if he's going to be right. And let's have a look at his latest feeling about what he thinks is going to happen to my favorite asset class, Bitcoin. You've got a huge amount of crypto. You me. Could you tell me how to get to the medical school? You go straight ahead and uh, you make the left over the bridge. That's a lovely accent you have. New Jersey? Austria. But what do you think the normal person should have? It, it, it is 1% we've heard. I think 2 to 3%. Austria! <laughs> well then, <laughs> good day, mate. <laughs> Let's put another shrimp on the barbie. Do you think, I okay. Have, I have 7% of my net worth in gold right now. Uh. Skis, huh? That's right. The yours? Uh-huh. Both of them? Yeah. You have more in Bitcoin or more in gold? More in Bitcoin. More in Bitcoin. Do you but think- But I'm speculating. You, you, <laughs> You said uh, now you think it's a ten to fourteen thousand range. You think it will think, it ever go back to five? I don't think so. I think if it goes below eighty five hundred, I'll get nervous. If it goes below six thousand, I'll get real nervous. What happened, Harry? Some little filly break your heart? No, it was a girl. Great at Belcher. I thought we were going to be together forever. <laughs> she give you any reason? Yeah, I called her up. She gave me a bunch of crap about me not listening to her enough or something. I don't know. I wasn't really paying attention. <laughs> I love I'm going to get really line. nervous, really nervous when it goes below 6,000. Really, no, 8,500. He's going to be somewhat nervous below 8,500. He's going to be really nervous below 6,000. Right. I, I, you know what? I love the fact that he owns more than 7% of his net worth in Bitcoin. Got to give him credit. That's yeah. like, you know, all in. Well, you know what? Like, uh, there, wait, wait, let's see. That, so 8,500, I got the chart up here. Yeah, so 8,500. Okay. That's I, not I, that much. Like, no. shit, we could be there in no time. Oh, yeah, that, that's – for Bitcoin, that's a, that's a one-week move, even a one-day yeah. move, arguably, but I'd, ha- I'd need a catalyst. But, yeah, I think, uh, I think if it gets below 6,000, again, there's a, a lot of uh, issues for sure. Anyway, uh, that was, I thought that was pretty good there. Kev, you did a good job. Thank you, sir. All right, let's move on. So top five things to watch – next week but as always we have to review what we were talking about last week so uh let's start with the bottom uh uh, chipotle right uh so what was uh, just very quickly i mean uh, it never really followed through too much since we mentioned it uh it's but it hasn't really dropped like some of the other stocks so i don't think there's for sure it's actually behaving pretty well it's holding up pretty well in this environment. That's uh, I'll give you credit for that one. Do you know so, what's yeah. funny? Actually, after last week's episode and do, talking about that, I had to go out and get some. That's what I had for dinner. Seriously. I'm not sure oh, I thought you meant some stock. Okay, you went to go no, get a no. burrito. No, no. Yeah, no. I, I, <laughs> Are you a burrito guy or a bowl guy? Do you get it I'm the bowl? a bowl guy. Yeah, I, really? I just, yeah. See, I don't know. I, yeah. I, I, I like it wrapped in a burrito. That's me. All yeah, right. And, so Okay. Number four, Apple. Uh, and uh, you know what? You, you wanted to talk prairie dogs. We'll get to that in a moment. That, this was the prairie dog. Yeah. I That's, don't really understand why they took it up so much in the first place. Come um, on. It was supposed to be autopilot to 280, right? Who said that? <laughs> I don't know. I'm just – the bulls. Yeah. The bulls. The bulls. Yeah, but – I don't like that stock at all. I just think it's a big stock, tough to grow. 
All right. Uh, uh, you heard it here. He yeah. Kevin says he doesn't like the stock. Any, at all. Any do you, do you like, have? But do you have um, an Android or do you have an iPhone? I have an iPhone. Okay, so you don't you don't hate it that much. You just wouldn't want. No, I, listen. Yeah, it, 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 I, liking a product is different than liking a stock. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, I do want to point out uh, number three on the semiconductors. You may have guttered this for everybody. Right? I did. I did. Uh, forcing you, you, yeah, you. Right now, apologize. You, say, <laughs> uh, you should apologize to anyone that's long semiconductors because you screwed it up for them. I did. I probably top ticked it to the hour. Yeah, you did. That's yeah. shame so on you. So for those who don't know, the, the reality is that I kind of I, – I brought to uh, Patrick's attention the fact that semiconductors were doing well and that they didn't end up being the worst performing stock like he or stock group as he predicted. And in doing so, I ensured that they became the worst performing stock group for the next week. And more importantly, uh, how's your beautiful trend on AMD? Like you not, butchered this one look, like – Not looking good. Oh, yeah, because like, I talked about the trend. Yeah, yeah, and you said how beautiful of a chart this is, and then so the moment the, the moment you <laughs> said that, some algo picked you up, and then it's like, no, we're gonna kibosh him. It's uh, it's the well, way no, it is. but hey, but as a okay, so you're a big technician. The fact that it broke that beautiful trend line that I or channel that I developed doesn't that mean it's now a sale? Uh, yeah, but you wait for bounces to sell into. You don't just uh, okay. you don't just hammer it on fresh new lows, right? You're, okay. you're looking for a tactical entry, but yeah. um, but it, it definitely does kibosh the uptrend. That's uh, that's for sure. I, I, let's, Number I'm two, sk- let's, we're, no, no, yes. we're skipping this because exactly. we're going to we're we, going to talk, talk, talk about that next yeah so, next week. What the hell with the FOMC? Well. Mid cycle adjustment. I just heard your voice when he said that. Like, hey, uh, so listen, he is so bad at this. Like, I think what the, the S and P is down ten out of the last twelve F- FOMC meetings. This guy just does not ha- know how to um, do anything in terms of having these sorts of press conferences. Yeah. Um, this is like when Gordon Gecko said, uh, "If this guy owned a funeral parlor, nobody would die." Um, that's how <laughs> bad it is. <laughs> And uh, I, I really think he should he would just be best issuing the statement and just st- shutting his mouth. And in fact, all of the FOMC on the on the board of governors should just shut their mouths because the reality is they don't know where the market's going. They don't know where the economy is going. Uh, and the fact that they're speculating on it is the market gets all in a tizzy the moment they say anything that doesn't correspond to what the prevailing wisdom is. And And, and there's just... Trust me, he might have said that it's a mid-cycle adjustment, and that is what he believes will happen. But if it does end up being uh, the economic economy, uh, the economy rolling over as much as you res- uh, like uh, bears believe, he will be cutting. So it doesn't matter what he thinks is going to happen. It matters what he will be doing. Anyways, he's just terrible. He should just stop having press conferences. <laughs> that's a, that's you heard, the end. Do, do, you you, you heard it here from Kevin for Hey. Yeah, hey. I, I think he should stop. In the old days, I always talk about this. Patrick, you probably don't remember this, but we used to have to go and watch for them to do open market operations to figure out if they had changed the, the rate. Right. They didn't even announce that they had changed the rates. They just went in and sold bills or bought bills and made, and made the whole street aware that their rate had changed. Yeah. And yeah. it used to happen at 1145. So uh, what's your over under that September is a cut? Mark is already pricing it in, right? Yeah. Listen, at this rate, the we'll talk about it. You know, going forward here on the top five things to watch next week. But if this continues, there's there's not a chance he's gonna. The market is gonna. He's gonna do whatever the market wants him to do. Like that's that's it. You know, I made that one tasteless video of with uh, Gordon Ramsay or not Gordon Ramsay, Ramsay from uh, Game of Thrones, and uh, the reality is that he has become the the both the market and Trump's. Uh, you know, well, don't gimp. say it. Don't say it. Gimp. <laughs> gimp. I didn't. I, I, right. I, Patrick, you don't need to give me lessons on. Uh, no, what only, I no, no say. That's, that? that's you, buddy. I'm okay, not going to say anything else. All okay, right. Let's, let's go. Let's top five on. things to watch next week. All right. So uh, top five things to watch. So, Kev, um, I'm going to let you kind of run with this one. Number, Number five. five. Okay. So for those who don't know. I, when the dollar broke out after the FOMC uh, meeting, I told Patrick, I said, I'm, I'm standing in here. I'm selling, I'm selling this uh, breakout 
Oh, yeah. As per the plan, remember I had spoken about it, that I was shorting half, and then the other half I was going to give him to on the rally? Yeah. And I was I was feeling pretty good, and I said I'm shorting it because I think it's going to be a prairie dog. And I swear to God, it was a couple hours later, I get this text from Patrick, and he says, for your information, I pulled out my 22 and shot your prairie dog. <laughs> and then the, the dollar... Proceeded to dish shit the bad after that. I swear to God, your timing was impeccable. Oh, okay. Stop for a second. Trump. I got trumped. No, that's not true. It was actually I got trumped. already. It was already rolling over even before Trump. But but he did help. There's no just doubt. a little bit, don't you think? Yeah, he did. But and it by, and, just, and before you take, but then your if you're going to say lap, you're going to be trumped, okay? <laughs> I see prairie dogs everywhere. <laughs> Before <laughs> that is me. That is that, me. that is I you. See, I, I do see prairie dogs everywhere. You're such hey, listen, a contrary. This is, this, this is what happens when you grow up in Manitoba, because there literally are prairie dogs everywhere. Yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, exactly. So I see them everywhere. Uh, there you go. And so, you know what? Before you take your victory lap, right? Yeah. The dollar was overstretched. I mean, we went during this rally. I mean, as a swing trader, uh, trading an hourly chart, fading this kind of an advance in the dollar over the span of a, of a, a week and a half is is a, a no brainer. But oh like, oh my god! Now all of a sudden it was no, a no brainer. No, all I'm saying, was, no, no, all I'm saying. But what look, happens if, you, to if the you're fact a day that it, trader? Look, if you're a day yeah. trader, congratulations, you clipped your point. All right, you know yeah. what? Yeah, there you go. You can do your little victory lap. I don't think this changes anything. I, I think that the dollar index here, this is uh, is going to pull back here for a week. It's going to be a buy on dip, and it's going to be making higher highs. This is you you all you're doing is doing taking a victory lap for for a short term swing trade. And congratulations, I wasn't, I wasn't, I'll give I it to you. I'll I give it to you. <laughs> Wasn't taking a you are lap. the day was, trading was, champion of the world, I, buddy. I was pointing out the fact that your time, your tweet, or your kind of text to me was just the timing was beautiful. That's oh, all I, I know it, I, it was. It was. Okay. I was Number just poking four. a little bit at you, but it, it worked okay. out perfectly. You yeah. know, I did you a favor because I was long you did. And gold. And, I, I agree. And that helped I agree. me out a little bit. Yeah, I did. All Number right. four. Number four. Uh, we had to talk about uh, this uh, uh, Chinese yuan. The renminbi, like I mean, uh, the moment Trump uh, fired those tariffs across the bow, uh, we had a, a pretty significant breakdown, right? And uh, this is a, a oh managed God. currency. Right? Can, can we do it properly? What <sighs> the current? Can you move it to the proper like so we can see? Everyone knows seven, and then you got this thing point one four. Yeah, it's three. a seven. What is that? There you no, go. Nobody knows. Okay, so there we go. So up means uh, one weakness, just so everyone knows. Okay, so we're we're pushing up back against that seven handle. Is this the, the point is, is that the PBOC has no reason to defend its uh, its currency if Trump is going to be um, or and its pegged area if Trump is going to be throwing tariffs, right? Like, so I think yeah. I think that this is them giving a warning that you want a weak dollar. Well, the, they're not going to play ball. What? Okay, so. Listen, this is a, a small little move in the grand scheme of things. Because, like, if you go back and look at the moves that they've oh, yeah. done throughout history, like, we could wake up and this thing could be nine. Fair enough. Right? And, I mean, we, and, went, we went from six and a quarter to seven in a span of two months. Uh, Three months. Yeah. But go, go back in terms of, like, before we, you know, it used to be this peg Monthly. currency. And you'll oh, see. The, oh, this is, actually, um, this is, hold on, let me pull it. Let me put up the CNY. Yeah. And you'll see that they, they really move this thing a lot. So it'll be interesting to see if we do get a situation like, there you go. So this, is, no, this is a monthly chart, though, dude. Yeah. But, you, but yeah, there a lot of those moves, those moves happen like in one fell swoop. So, so really, but though, you ha we do have to kind of uh, observe that the $7 level is uh, has been tested on multiple occasions since 2016. So a break of that level to the upside sets yeah. in motion uh, uh, potentially a lot of stuff trend. and yeah. a lot of stuff. But before I do anything more, uh, talk about the fundamentals, put that chart back up. And you know, I am not I don't practice the dark art of uh, technical All right. analysis. But is this not a cup and handle like you've never seen? Yeah, no, this is dude, this is this is ready to go. I mean, at this stage, 
Uh, oh, but you know what? No, I'm going to be the contrarian. It's going to prairie dog, buddy. It's going to prairie dog. Oh, that's that. <laughs> That bad boy's not prairie dogging. If they let it go above seven, it's going to I'm not going to bet money on that. I'm with you, actually, so we'll see. Yeah, like I just – like if they if they let it go, they're just, they know that there's going to be an avalanche of it. And if they let it go through seven, they'll let it go for a while before they'll they'll, they'll wait for the sp- everyone to kind of be leaning into it really hard and for it to get really kind of toppy, and then they'll go back. But anyways, yeah. I just think right. it's, there's a lot of risk. There's a lot of fundamental risk to this. This is actually the chart to watch because if that changes, if it ends up being that the Trump is kind of instigated a trade war that's going to be executed through currency devaluations, then you're going to find that the risk in the system is going through the roof. Right, right, right. All right, number three. I wanted to ask the question, is there another leg higher coming here in the bond proxies? Obviously, uh, um, bonds took off again uh, after the FOMC and, and tariffs. Uh, and so yeah. we have... Well, it was really the tariffs, right? Re- it was the tariffs that launched yeah. the... Uh, particularly, what's am- amazing is, is it's at the longest end of the curve, the great, uh, the long duration as- uh, bonds that took off so spectacularly. Like, look at this. Um, this is the, um, the 30-year chart, right? Uh, yeah. A 30-year bond. And just like, what a breakout. The point, though... Is, is that those bond proxy sectors, particularly the two I was going to mention was utilities and the REITs uh, seem uh, uh, to not uh, seem to be at least initially immune to the market weakness and uh, and seem to be actually behaving half decently. Let me pull up the XLU here. Uh, and while you can see here the XLU, which is the utilities, uh, have kind of turned back up heading back toward those uh, uh, those highs. But if you take individual names, let's say a Southern company or something like that, bro- already broken to higher highs, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and then you have XLRE, which is the REITs. You can see they're edging right back. They have almost no weakness in the last few days while the market's breaking. And it, it seems to be heading right back to the highs. So do we have another leg coming in these uh, bond proxy, high dividend paying sectors. What's your take? I, I feel like I have lost all um, kind of ability, or not ability, or like, like. Credibility? Credibility. Uh, you, you definitely yeah, have to, lost to, all your credibility. Yeah, you see. Uh, on uh, this, on the on the bonds, I don't know. It's, th- listen, I would have never thought we'd be here. I would have never thought that this would have gotten this bad and the fact that this is doing this and i'm not sitting in here telling you that they're going uh so lower is probably a sign that they're going lower so here, here's here's my opinion yeah. uh this is late stage uh i mean whether you want to call this a, I, I you know to give the baseball analogy is it the seventh inning eighth inning ninth inning are we in overtime i don't know i think that there's room for these to break out still to higher highs. But they're, I think they're much closer to the ultimate uh, turn point where they're going to be big sells. Uh, are you talking about the proxies or are you talking about the, proxies. the bonds? Proxies. Oh, because the bonds you love. Well, but no, look, at some point, the bonds will run out of juice to the upside too. I mean, if the TLT rips to 140, you have to ask yourself whether or not you want to keep squeezing the lemon juice out of that lemon that's been squeezed that much, right? There, there's yeah. a point where the risk reward proposition diminishes, right? And so- Well, no, uh, but this is where the convexity kicks in and you really get the big up moves. And oh. don't forget, according to Citibank, the 30-year treasury is the cheapest asset on the planet. And I shit you not, that was this this uh, this uh, report given out yesterday. Wow! I right, look, so, I'm, I'm long bonds. I'm happy to be there, but I don't know if I want to drink that Kool Aid. Uh, look, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm I'm a trader. We're too busy having your sours. Uh, yeah, uh, as I'm a trader, and I'm going to continue to try to profit from the upside of bonds. But uh, I'm I'll have my one foot out the exit door at some point. I'm not going to wow. stay married to this trade forever. Uh, and when, when it gives the signs, I'll go. But anyway, what, what, the proxies, the REITs and the utilities, I think that they still break to higher highs. I still think they go, but I think you're playing with fire because at some point uh, that, that's going to run out of juice on the upside. And they're very expensive at these levels, in my opinion. What's your, okay. Do you agree with that? I don't disagree. But okay. uh, as I say, I, no credibility Lost. here in okay. terms of anything fixed income. So you, you want to talk gold? Gold and gold miners. 
And I, I guess one of the things that I noticed is GDX. Pull up that chart. I find that an interesting Well, first, chart. here's gold. And we are breaking yeah, to 52-week no uh, highs, yeah. right? Uh, 14.58 on this chart. And, uh, and a lot of technical measured moves are all pointing to 1,500 to 1,550. So there's a little more juice left in, in gold, uh, for technically anyway. And uh, you're, but you want the gold miners, the GDX, right? Yeah. I, I found the action in the last couple of days actually very interesting. We had what looked like they should have got some big selling. And right. they were met with buying. And I, I look at this and... Uh, I, like I'm not trying to say that they should be you know you should be buying them up here, but I I do think that it's interesting that that there was every excuse for this thing to roll over and it doesn't seem to be. I I worry that um, one of the things that you might make a mistake on with gold is by assuming that it's run too far too fast, because if you step back into the big picture and think about it, if we're going into a currency uh, kind of uh, war which I do believe that there's a very good chance we are. And we're getting into a situation where interest rates are all negative and even in the States, they're becoming a negative in a real basis. Gold could fly. Like I think the mistake could be saying like gold, it's only, you know, it's, it's gone a hundred bucks. So I have to, uh, I have to sell it. And the reality is it might be going for the big move. So this could be it. So just uh, look, you don't gooch for everyone, but I want to point no, I out know. What uh, but I, I, I want to so just uh, say something that uh, undoes your goocher here because you're you you just set it up for the goocher, so just uh, just say I, some I, words I'm of just, caution. Uh, <laughs> well, the, 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 I'll tell you what's why it might be right and why I don't own very much if it, like that up here, so that's why it could really explode higher. So there don't you go. Worry about it, folks. All right. So what I wanted to point out is go back to 2016. Uh, it did something very very similar in, in the two green boxes I have right. And oh, yeah. it, it, it basically blasted off and it took about, uh, let's, let's just round that to like eight, nine weeks. Uh, back then in 2016, it went from 13 bucks up to 21. And so a lot of people already witnessed a, pretty much a double in short order. That's uh, compared to now, we only went to 20 to 28. Yeah. And then uh, if you sold, you missed the move from 21 to 31. Which was, uh, which was where the, the next major leg was. And the point is, is that I'm not saying that it, uh, it has to play out the same way, but you know, if this thing, if gold's going to 1500 plus and this thing cracks 28, uh, I mean, there, uh, this could be 35, you know? Yeah, I mean. I, I agree. I th don't ever forget that, uh, that great uh, presentation that Grant Williams gave where he said like, uh, I can't remember it was called what if or something something yeah. of that nature and it was just he went through and showed how small the gold market is in the grand scheme of things and how much a uh, little reallocation on the kind of pension plan and endowments a little reallocation can send gold and the gold stocks flying just flying D so yeah, don't down at the down I think it was Grant said something on the lines of that uh, down at the bottom the capitalization of the entire gold miner space had the same market cap as Cisco Systems. There you go. You're right? Like, it's I mean, just, it's, it, so it's, it's so small. It's so small that if people want an allocation, there isn't enough stock to go around. Anyway, so it, just we be can careful daydream, shorting. Right? Yeah. We can, just we can be daydream. careful shorting that thing because although I agree that it is kind of crowded, at the same time, the possibility of an outsized move. And if you want to talk about like convexity and stuff taking off, that's where I think it would take off more than a bond. But anyways, go on. Yeah. Number one, what do we got Number for Number one, and well, we ju we ha listen, all of our listeners want to know what we think. Was that a major market top or not? You know, and um, look, I've been looking for a market top for uh, a couple months with some straddles on, on open. So like, I think that um, it's pretty clear that I have uh, a bit of a bias, but um, I think that there's a couple of key te technical hurdles that have to be uh, still beat. Uh, you know, for me, uh, I think that there's room, uh, there's some fib levels down around even the, uh, the mid 2800s, where in theory, if this market pullback lasted just a few days, 
uh, reversed and then shot back up, it could have just been a buy on dip. Uh, the, the real technical damage where it's going to be very hard for the bulls to undo it uh, is all south of that because at that moment, the, the bear market could take a life of its own and that's where those kind of liquidity plunges can really accelerate. So uh, to me, th this is, there's not enough technical damage to say that this is all bearish from here. The buy on dip traders can show up on Monday and, uh, and you can look at this chart and say nothing, it did nothing wrong, right? Well, so Patrick, first of all, this will be a very unusual event because I think both of us got bearish. You gave me a lot of flack for turning a uh, table up there and becoming bearish. So at this point, we were uh, both you bearish. You made a great call. We might, you made a great and call. We might, well, we might both be right. I'm going to go out on a limb here and I'm going to say I'm actually getting worried about something more ominous than you are. I think that it's, uh, I'm not saying it's for sure going to happen, but for the first time I'm, I'm actually worried about stuff. I think the action in the yen, I think the action in gold, I think that the odds of the renminbi doing something strange, even bonds are kind of, I feel like the volatility is going through the roof and that's all, all those things, you know, point to more weakness ahead for the stock market. And the fact is that we're doing this in August when there's lots of people away. You know, famously there Lower was the flash volume, cash. Yeah, it's, but things like that. I just it's think also the risk about, I think, I think there's a lot of people that are scared of, uh, of uh, taking action in this month because like August, September, October are, uh, have such a, a notorious history that uh, is a lot of people may uh, be far more reluctant to stick their neck out and put big size out there to defend the price, right? For sure, and and like the, there's a lot of stuff that's trading trading kind of sketchy right but, now. But how about the sentiment? Do you, like you know what? If you go back to um, June uh, and even go back to the April May high, uh, there were so many people that were bearish. Like okay. it was it was super yeah, yeah. crowded. I, I, and, but and I feel that this time around, that same choir of people are are very quiet. Well, and but don't forget, yeah, that like we were giving Mike Novogratz a hard time, but there was all of a sudden when it went back up to there to three thousand, you were giving me a hard time because I had flipped bearish. I was saying, why now that we're up here, you know, what's wrong with selling something that you know that's going up and buying something that's going down? And I think that there was a fair amount of people that were talking about a blasting off, and for the first time, this idea of uh, what, 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 you know, why used, used to give me a hard time because I said we would have. Uh, what was it the the rally you'd call it the uh, what did I what, call wait, it? what did you what did you call it anyways with too many beers for us already yeah. Patrick um, so the uh, the the takeoff rally and we and we sat there and you gave me a hard time about it and then when I flipped it was uh, there a lot of people were disappointed and said no 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 the blow off the blow off rally right and and everyone said they a lot of people for the first time were looking for it like I, so I actually disagree it felt to me like that the sentiment had changed. And that we did finally get some people throwing in the towel and getting bullish, but regardless, throwing in the towel on the shorts. Yeah, yes. But okay. regardless, I agree. Patrick, that's a, that's the, my re point. the reality is that when the facts change, you have to change. And I think that the <laughs> that Trump, no, but I think Trump really did throw the whole market for a loop with this recent development. I think it's a bigger deal than um, the market realizes yet. Yeah. Because I, I, I think, mean, and the other things, I, I, Patrick, I, I talked about this on Twitter a little bit. Like, let's think about this. He didn't understand for a while that he was able to go and put on, on uh, tariffs on his own. Like, it was when he first came in, he started complaining about it. And then he figured out that he was allowed to unilaterally put on tariffs. So what did he do? He started putting on tariffs. Right. Okay. What is he complaining about now? He's complaining about the dollar. Yep. I think that and he, interest once rates. He, but I think I think yeah. that he, no, it's a listen, double edged sword. He, he he got what he wanted or somewhat what he wanted on interest rates. He's basically, you know, bullied uh, Powell into doing his bidding. Maybe he's not as as kind of dovish as he wants him to be. But wait until he figures out that he can actually go through the treasury and and start to influence the value of the dollar. So the only trade that I actually feel good about Patrick down here is buying F FX of all. Hmm. That's probably my only high conviction trade down here. Because if you go look at, at FX vol versus um, stock market vol versus bond vol, both of which are elevated into this, FX vol is, is almost on the low still. Yeah. 
And it, and that's because for a long time there was no currency wars, there was no issues. But just wait and see what happens when all of a sudden, uh, you know, China says, "Well, screw you," and you know, wake up and it's nine. We're we're trading at nine one. And yeah. and and let's just see what happens when when Trump goes and says, "Well, guess what? We're gonna you know, Europe. We're gonna go sell dollars." Anyways, I think that there's a lot yeah. more risk in the system. Well, listen. Than, than, so you you actually give it a better odds than not that that could be a major top. Yeah, I probably do. Yeah. I, I, well, you I, know I what? Really Listen, do. my my wallet will love you if you're right. Uh, so uh, you know, because I I'm I'm by, I don't have very many long positions other than in some beaten up energy names and and a few of these little kind of periphery areas. So I'm not going to complain. You know, if, now having said that, if tomorrow he goes and he and he does a trade deal and it doesn't and it doesn't look like it's escalating and there's a few things happen, I reserve the right to kind of give up on that call. But right now, all signs seem to point to me to the fact that it's also only going to get worse and the situation is that there's there's very little liquidity in august and there's lots of things that are trading like uh like a rat on acid and it's just i think it's a it's a time for the sidelines more than anything else all right you heard it here from kev let's uh <laughs> let's move on so yeah. uh, uh parting words of wisdom i found something that i, I thought uh, many of our listeners would appreciate about you it's a, it's like it was it, it was like it's almost coming out of your mouth. Why don't you read it? Because it sounds better. Okay. When when you're saying this. All right. I swim against the tide because I like to annoy. Thank you, Carlos Zafon <laughs> made the statement, but you own it. This is uh, <laughs> you, you bought the like you to, bought the rights. I, you bought I just the like rights. I like to annoy you, Patrick. I just like to annoy you. Oh no 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 no! Trust me. What many listeners uh, will appreciate. <laughs> Find me annoying as well. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, like when you flip-flop from being long to short. What did you do? You did that just them. to annoy them. That's right. Oh, yeah. I know. You pissed them off, Kev. You pissed yeah. them off. <laughs> well, anyways, great show. Patrick, <laughs> where can they find uh, more about you and uh, what you do for a living? If, if uh, you can, uh, anyone can find months. me at uh, bigpicturetrading.com or follow me on Twitter at Patrick Ceresna. How about you, Kevin? And for, and for me, it's at Kevin Muir and uh, check out the macrotourist.com. And, and, and please sign up for the market huddle. Um, we actually, every week we send out an email that includes chart package and everything like that. Although I think this week we don't have many charts to send out, but usually if the guest provides a chart package, it's, it's included and it's a lot of times it's some great stuff. So make sure you sign up. There you go. Okay. Thanks. All right. All right, so we're uh, in the after hours show. Uh, Jared's uh, back here to join us. Uh, and, uh, well, Jared, that was a pretty good interview right off the bat uh, talking about interest rates. I want to pick your brain on a lot of other interesting things. But uh, I want to first uh, circle back. Uh, I mean, you, you live out in uh, Myrtle Beach. I had a chance to do lunch with you uh, when, uh, when I was out there in South Carolina. And uh, it was a good time. And uh, what, what made you uh, want to go out there to Myrtle Beach and uh, settle down over there? Is, is that uh, where you're from or what, what inspired you to be out there? Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't really my idea. It's worked out great. I love it here, but it definitely was not my idea. So, at, you know, this was back in 2010. I was in New York and my wife is a professor at Princeton. And uh, she had a five-year appointment. And once that appointment was up, it, was, she, it wasn't a 10-year job. Uh, once that appointment was up, she had to go somewhere and she applied for a bunch of jobs and, you know, Coastal Carolina University was open. And she says, what do you think about going to Myrtle Beach? I'm like, I don't know. I never, I've never been there, but it's got beach in the name. So how bad can it be? Uh, and uh, we kind of moved down here sight unseen. And that was back in 2010. So we've been here for a long time. That's a uh, bold move. I actually yeah. saw you tweet the other day that said something as long as you don't have uh you're not overly sensitive on, and you're not going to have a kind of a conniption, a conniption at every single Trump sticker. You're going to have a great time here. Yeah. I mean, a funny tweet. Yeah. The funny thing, and that's absolutely true. Like the funny thing, I mean, this is a red state, although it's not a super red state. It's not Alabama. It's not Mississippi. Uh, you know, a lot of people, if, if you don't understand the South, like there's different areas of the South and the Carolinas are not quite as conservative, but still like, you know, if you're, you know, if you're somebody from Connecticut and every time you see a Trump sticker, you, you just have a seizure like it, it, you're just like you're not going to be able to function on here. If you can just sort of tune that stuff out and you know, yeah. then this is really like it's it's super cheap. 
The weather is awesome. It's sunny a lot. The worst time of year is actually the summer. The summer, it's like really humid, so it's not that pleasant. But like, you know, spring, winter, fall is really great. Um, you know, I love it. Yeah, so I'm a big windsurfer, so I go up to the Outer Banks, which is North Carolina. And I think it's some of the most kind of underrated beach area in the U.S. period. Like yeah. it's just, it's, it's outstanding. So uh, yeah. Jared, just to, to change the subject a little bit, like I know our good friend, Tony Greer always gives you the gears on your electronic dance music. I can't <laughs> help but ask you. Like, yeah, I've been DJing for about 11 years and uh, I, you know, I, I love the music and whenever I have a chance to, you know, put on a show, it's usually in New York city. Um, you know, I have a mailing list and, you know, the dirt net people know like when there's a party in New York city, a lot of them come out. So it's, yeah, it's a fun hobby. Oh, well, why don't you give us the, uh, if anyone's a kind of an EDM person and wants to get on your list, how did they get signed up for your, uh, your list? Yeah. Just go to, uh, www.djstochastic.com. That's D J S T O C H A S T I C, which obviously is a, Fun trading joke. So yeah. we get a, we get a lot of uh, yeah. uh, kind of technical sc- what I like to call squiggle traders because of Patrick <laughs> practices the dark arts. Um, you know what? When you said Tomorrowland, I kind of laughed. I thought to myself, Neverland. Um, obviously, that's not the same thing. W- no. Tomorrowland is like some sort of uh, festival. I'm I'm googling it here as we speak. It just looks like there's a lot of uh, kind of uh, millennials consuming vast amounts of drugs. Is that basically what it is? Uh. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm not really into the. I'm not really into the festival scene. Like the festivals, I think are super annoying. Uh, you're out there in a field for like ten hours a day. It's hot. You know, people are like crashing into you. Like it's just. You know, I I prefer going to clubs. Like I don't really like you know the big uh, festival sound. I like the small room sound. Um, so it's just it's just a different environment. Okay, I always laugh because I found out. I so. Jared, I'm useless at this, and I and I I don't know anything of electronic dance music. And some younger person was trying to teach me about it, and he was trying to. They were trying to tell me how much some of these DJs will make in in Las Vegas, and I was blown away at, at what a good DJ could, commands in Vegas. And I was thinking to myself, you know what, the 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 CEO of uh, Goldman Sachs, he might be he might have been better off being a DJ. Yeah, I don't think so. But even still, like, those guys, those guys in uh, those guys in Vegas make like four hundred thousand a night. Uh, at, you know, at the peak in two thousand fourteen, when EDM was like really exploding, it was about seven hundred thousand a night. Um, wow. So but that's a you know, lot of bread, man. Seven hundred you know, a night if you work. Yeah. So you can only work three nights a week, right? Because you work Monday, you work Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Is that right? So seven hundred yeah, a week. It's, it's, it's actually one times uh no, is they, that just yeah. from is just just from the gate admission shit no, no that's what they not. pay listen they pay that's what they pay these guys yeah but the, the economics of that are basically you have a bunch of people buying tables you know for five thousand ten thousand twenty thousand bucks uh you know like it's big high rollers getting tables plus drinks plus you know i mean the club probably clears uh I would say a million a night. So to pay a DJ 400,000, if he's bringing the crowd is not unreasonable, you know? Yeah. Fair yeah. enough. You know, but the, but the, the, the Vegas clubs, like, I don't like it. Like I said, like, I like this. I like the small room sound like that. A lot of that music is not for me. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, All right. Let's, let's talk, talk about markets. markets. Yeah, yeah, I know. I screwed up with the. Oh, the, no, the no. You didn't screw up. Right. Listen, but Jared, uh, let's let's talk to markets because, wow, just the last two days have been nuts. Right. Uh, and so, we, you know, Powell, first of all, uh, sucker punching the market by not giving them what they wanted. And then Trump uh, sucker punching uh, the market right back. And so we had basically. Uh, uh, this uh, this pop in the dollar that's already uh, pulling back here, but the stock market's not liking this. I mean, we're pretty much now about seventy points off the highs, eighty points off the the highs. Uh, do you think this is the beginning of some sort of a market correction? Is this going to uh, sustain for multiple weeks? Are we going into a, a deeper pullback? What's your thinking here on the markets after seeing the forty eight hours here? Yeah, I actually, you know, it's it's funny, like. Uh, I, I wrote in my newsletter earlier this week. I'm like, I don't know about stocks here. I literally, it's, I said, I just had a hunch. This is just like trader's instinct. Like I'm not, I'm not, I really don't, I don't have anything concrete to back it up. It just didn't feel right. And, 
if you go back to the last, I mean, the last two few corrections we had, the one in December and then the ball explosion, and then there was another one, those were all V tops, right? Th that was, those were V tops. And you don't, you, you don't end a bull market with a V top. And what, if you look at the chart right now, we are actually sort of forming out a U top or just rolling over slowly. Uh, it looks, if you, if you take today's chart and you hold it up against 2007, it looks kind of similar. Um, so I know this is all very unscientific, uh, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not super positive here. And I, you know, it's been, a, it's been a really long time since I've tried to lay out a short and I'm, you know, I don't know. I kind of want to do it, but I'm a little, a little scared. So. Right. Right. And how, what's, uh, what's your thinking here? On uh, on some of the these periphery, like do you track all the European markets and so on, or are you just predominantly focused a lot on the uh, the U.S. equity here? Or do you have do you have some market calls just on what's happening in the euro stock or these other uh, European markets? Uh, not so much um, not so much continental Europe, but I've been focusing a lot on the U.K. and Brexit lately, and I seem to have a very out of consensus opinion that. Uh, yeah that the pound will rally on a no deal Brexit. Um, you know, off I mean, of a lower level. I mean, like we're, we're no, talking. October, no. So right? listen, I'm with, I'm with Jared here. I'm going to interrupt uh, Patrick. I completely agree. I think we're, we're down and out this thing. I've been buying pounds lately. I think it's a great purchase. I think you could stand in here now buying right this. now, that, right now. Yeah. Like I, I listen, I'm actually in agreement with you guys. I just think you guys oh, are shit. early. I no, just no, think you're Jared. early. Well, that's good. Like, that's good that you think we're early. So, Jared, yeah, I mean, are you buying it here? Like, are you buying them here, or are you waiting for the no deal? Uh, I, I, I would say I'm at about half my position right now, and I bought a quarter of it about a month ago, and I bought another quarter of it a few days ago. Um, I'm I'm similar. I started guys, a, a day or two ago, oh and I'm, I'm halfway there, and I'm going to buy more on, on any bad news. It is you, dirt cheap, buddy. It is so cheap. You're gonna I'm you're gonna get a reaction. Look, look. Okay, no. listen. Okay. Is is the pound ready to bounce and be back at one twenty three, one twenty four? And you guys can clip three hundred pips. Congratulations. That's you know you guys are no, probably no. gonna it's be right higher, on that. Man. But no, this is not the turn point. This is not the the bottom. I I'll, I'll right now stick my neck out. We're we're heading down to one fifteen. Like, okay. I mean, now whoa, whoa, with we that have the said, makings of a bet. We have a makings okay, of a bet. How, what is that? That's six handles lower. So yes. I say it, I'd say it hits 128 be, or 127 before 115. You're done. You want to do stakes or you want to do uh, like you want to cheap out because you don't feel so good about it. Look. All right. I Patrick. No, but listen. Just tell me. Steaks let, no, no. Or burgers, stop, stop for stop for a second. Because. I think that we, even if it got to 126, 127 here in the next reaction, because it's oversold and it's going to fuck him out. Okay. Okay. And Patrick, so it's going to do I'll that. Give but, you, I'll but, give you an extra two handles. I'll give you an extra two <laughs> handles. 129 versus 115. Done. Done. Okay. What do you want? Burgers. Okay. Burgers. It's burgers or steaks? You pick. Burgers. I burgers. Feel, burgers. I feel, yeah, you don't feel as confident. Hey, well, uh, you Jared, want to, we, listen, we, we, we make a fucking steak dinner bet like every episode. I, know, I mean, how I many know, steaks it's can a, you eat? Well, anyways, listen, uh, Jared, let, we like to bet on these things all the time. So, uh, and, and, and he's been, uh, although he's been right a couple of times, he still, he still <laughs> is the guy that's doing it. So tell yeah. me, you know what? We, we interrupted you. We interrupted you. I'm no. sorry. We interrupted you to do our bet. Why don't you tell us why? But you think by that, by oh, the way, the, I'm, the I'm buying the dip higher. at 115. but let's go, Jared. What, okay, what, Jared, tell your, us why you think you should own the, the, the pound. Well, first of all, uh, I think that uh, I would, I would, I hope that it goes to 129, but I fear that it goes to 115. And I actually think, I think that's the more likely outcome. Uh, oh, there, there's, I love like, it. You know, so I, I love it. Boris, you know, Boris Johnson, I didn't, I didn't know a lot about Boris Johnson. I did some research, but more importantly, have, have you ever like, I listened to his voice without watching TV, without looking, without looking at the hair, right? Without looking at him, without looking at the hair, just listen to his voice. This is a guy that gets what he wants and he is in a hurry and everything about his actions, everything he has said, that his cabinet that he's put together, everything communicates that Britain is going to be out of the EU one way or another on October 31st. That is going to happen. Okay. So I, I agree. I agree so with that, you there. I agree with you there. So then it's just a question of, you know, what is 
uh, the, the market reaction going to be when that happens. And a lot of people view that as really negative. Uh, people say, people are saying, you know, it's going to parity. Uh, and, you know, I've always thought that Brexit was positive for the UK in the long run. Uh, you know, so what I'm concerned about with this position is that there's a big flush uh, in the interim and I get stopped out. Uh, but, you know, yeah. Well, okay, so here's here's my thinking, Jared. I completely agree with your analysis, but I think that they're going to do fiscal, and when they do fiscal, you're going to find that it's it's actually going to the economy is going to do better than we expect. And maybe you're right. Maybe we get the 115 tick, but I I really think that we're not going to. And I think that the rally, I like to look at euro euro pound. What I call the uh BMW Jaguar spread. And if you look at that, and you think back to, I guess it was, let's just pull up the chart. Can you pull that up, Patrick? Yeah, yeah, I'm pulling it up right now. So we had a move down in April when everyone got kind of bullish on the prospects of Britain being able to negotiate it. Everything was great. And every hedge fund in the world was short euro pound. Like they all were. It was one of the most popular crowded trades. And I think this whole move from 85 up to 91 has been a, a process of flushing them out. And I kind of look at this as the bad news is increasingly all in this. And I'm not as bearish on euro in general. So I just think they're both. Your only problem high. with your trade here is the fact that it's not accounting for the dollar because they can both go down against the dollar together. Yeah. And so listen. Yeah, I know. You're a big dollar bull. What do you think, Jared? We haven't got your opinion. Where is the U.S. dollar the next month, year, and five years? All right, let me change the subject, actually. Let me divert you. Um, <laughs> so let's you know, let's talk about dollar CAD, and let's have a conversation about that. Oh, uh, sure. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't – do maybe you can help me understand some stuff. Uh, okay. I doubt it, but we'll try. Your econ your economic statistics are a disaster. Like stats can is a mess. You have unreliable statistics, and okay. uh, like uh, there's no there's no chance that a hundred thousand people a month are getting jobs in China. I, I don't care how much immigration there is; it just doesn't make any sense. And it, you know, I, I like I think the view there's this it, there's this prevailing view that Canada is exempt. Uh, from this slowdown that seems to be happening around the world, you know, and as I look at the rest of the data, I'm like, I mean, what the hell? Like, why? Like, why is that? Why don't you guys tell me that? Oh, I actually, I'm with you, buddy. I'm. I, I've recently become somewhat bearish on Canada. I think that uh, we think our shit doesn't smell, and I actually think that uh, shorting Canadian banks and buying U.S. banks is one of the greatest like kind of trades for the next year or two. Yeah, I mean, but people have been talking about that since 2013. You know, so no, why I agree. now? I agreed. I well, why now? First of all, a couple of things. One of the big kind of key components to this was the fact that everyone thinks that the U.S. is a lower tax state. They all like if you ask people what would a, a U.S. bank pay in tax, they would have said, I'm not sure, but it's going to be significantly less than the Canadian banks. Well, I can tell you the figures. The U.S. banks, the median bank in the XLF paid something like 30 percent over the last decade. OK, in Canada, that was 20 percent. So with ta with trucks, um, trucks, with Trump's tax cuts, we're actually in a situation now where that is being lowered to the same. So now no longer are we having kind of the, the, the situation where we have a tax benefit. So that's part of the reason we've done better, okay? The other reason is, the fact is that we've had, um, our consumer has been expanding credit for the past, let's say, 20 years, because the reality is that we didn't have the pause in 08 like you did. So we have been, uh, the banks have had a tailwind of a consumer that's getting more credit cards, getting more houses, all this shit. Like it's just basically one thing after another. It's all worked out well. So we've had a better tax rate. We've had a consumer that's been expanding. Everything's been great. Now, what's changed? We have finally hit the point where we cannot put any more debt on it. And although, you know, like we can, we can, like I'm not a big one to say like, uh, um, I'm not a debt alarmist. I do believe that on the private sector, there are limits. And I do believe that Canada's hit it. And at the same time, I think when you look at the U.S., 
I think that the millennials there have been reluctant because of what they've seen happen to their folks during the 08 crash to put any sort of debt on. So I just think Trump is going to go and he's going to figure out a way to get the housing going there. And it's going to be a tailwind for the U.S. bank. And the Canada is not going to shit the bed in terms of like, you know, have the same sort of catalytic, too many beers, uh, contraction that the U.S. had. But the reality is that we're going to suffer and we're going to underperform you guys for the next kind of five years easy that's what yeah i, I mean it, that would that would make me happy but like in the in the short term i mean we have the possibility that the fed is going to cut 100 basis points plus and plus doesn't look like he wants to cut at all yeah but that's only going to be bad for our economy over the long run i mean do you think he's forced to cut oh well, um okay yeah. so here's a little tidbit i have I, i'll tell you they think um that they really do believe the Bank of Canada really believes that our shit doesn't smell. Yeah, <laughs> they think I know. that our economy yeah. they believe our economy is as strong as as as, yeah. as those statistics. And um I, I'll tell you, I, I was out the other day and I was talking to somebody that uh that was selling to, to these different um to these different developers up in northern north of Toronto, and uh, like although our our cranes and, and stuff in Toronto with the condos are going like gangbusters, the the single family homes are suffering, and and yeah. you look at Vancouver, it's already rolled over in Vancouver, and you and the fact that China is having trouble. Listen, we are not immune to the same problems that Australia is having. There is no doubt about it. And so you asked, what's going to be the difference? The difference is that we finally got the other parts of the uh, kind of equation working against us. We don't have China being able to, like, you know, stimulate. We don't have um, all sorts of, uh, like, let's face it. We're not going to get the, the, the easy money from, from China. There's no way you're going to get all this Chinese money coming in and buying Vancouver homes like they did. And, so, and Jared, you're right when you say that there was all sorts of crazy shit happening. I tell the story about the fact that I have buddies that sell their homes in, in Shaughnessy, which is a fancy Tony uh, kind of neighborhood in Vancouver. They would get their homes bought by numbered Chinese companies and they would rent them back from those people and they would send them checks like a series of post dated checks and those checks would not be cashed. <laughs> Uh, that's awesome. I, mean, I, I, I don't know what you guys know about my involvement with this trade. Uh, you know, I, I, oh, I know it's you. I know you've been like a little short for a long time and thinking it's the, like you've been you've been calling for it a while, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, actually, I started uh, I started uh, shorting CAD in 2013 when it was at 101. Um, so that has worked out. And actually, you know, my target all along has been 160, and now I'm kind of uh, reevaluating that. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the banks have been a terrible trade. I paid, I paid just a ridiculous amount of money in dividends. So, um, yeah, that's why, I, that's why I think you have to be long something on the other side. That's why to me being long against the U S banks is, is a no brainer. You also look at the price to book. Our price to book is way more than you guys, because we are supposedly so much better managed and all this, but yada, yada, yada. Like I really think the Canadian banks are versus the U S banks are just an, a slam dunk sale. Like that spread trade. I just think for the next kind of five years, you just, you just sell it and forget about it because you guys, you guys hate your banks and we over love our banks. That's the, that's the long and short of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so that's, that's so so you so you were expecting us to defend CAD. We're not going to defend CAD at all. In fact, Patrick shits all over Canada all the time. He's the <laughs> biggest bear there is. Here's the question I have for you, Jared. I think that Australia is worse than Canada than Canada. Uh, it sure think? it sure seems that way. Uh, you know, I, I I wisely have decided not to shore Aussie. Uh, I think Aussie's just a tough short. Like I just, I, I have, I don't know. I can't figure out the price action on that currency, so I just kind of stay away from it. Uh, and there's no, um, there's no banks listed in the U.S. No Aussie banks listed in the U.S. So I, I, I don't really have any skin in the game. But you know, the people I talk to in Australia, they're like, oh yeah, this is this is bad. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But yet the banks are roll. I mean, rocking right. Like, that's the problem. Again, yeah. we have a situation where their economy, it looks like it's like their, their real estate's rolling over, their economy doesn't look so hot, yet because of the, the easy monetary policy, the banks are rocketing higher.
So yeah, I'm showing a chart here of the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. Like yeah, the thing, it's crazy. Uh, it's gone from 65 to 85 bucks almost. And is uh, that in Australian dollars or US yeah? That's dollars? on the that's on the ASX. Yeah, and see, that's a problem. You know, a trade that I've liked for a long time, Jared, is I liked actually shorting Australia CAD cross rate. Mm. And, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you why I like that. I kind of looked at it and I said, Australia's biggest trading partner is China. Canada's tra biggest trading partner is the U.S. You get rid of all the U.S. dollar kind of you know currency reserve shit, and they're both commodity trades. And like you just kind of think to yourself. To me, it's basically saying that Ch U.S. is going to beat China, and that's how I've looked at that trade. And so far, it's worked. Yeah, I've got, it's been great. I mean, it went from like nine, ninety-eight down to like eighty-nine. Yeah, uh, are you still so you it, still have it on? I still have it on. I'm trying wow. not to look at it. <laughs> trying not to look at it. What else do you like, Jared? What other trades you got for us? Uh, I'm actually I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up here pretty soon. Uh, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go home and get a cigar, um, which <laughs> which is which is like my new hobby. Like actually, your new hobby. You gotta leave yeah. us with one idea, one idea before you leave. Uh, well, I don't know. I I kind of gave you guys a bunch of them. Uh, let me... <laughs> no more. That's it. You're done. <laughs> All right, okay, yeah, we're cut off. Uh, I, mean, I, think, I mean, really, like I, I you know I think my best idea is this, is the uh, steepener. Um, you know, I, one, one way or another, either Trump is going to get rid of Powell or, or he will get his message across or the Fed will just figure it out as an institution and, uh, they, they will cut rates more aggressively. Um, okay. So what part of the curve do you play? I do twos tens. Yeah. Yeah. You like twos tens? Yeah. Okay. I'm with you. So are, like you're, you're well. not shaken out of, uh, with this last little move. You still think it's a good level to put it on? Yeah, I do. It's, you know, I mean, it's just hard. It's hard for twos tens to go negative with absolute rates in the one handle. That's just hard to do. I might go negative. Uh, if it goes negative, I might, you know, I might put on more. Um, you know, I mean, ultimately the curve, I, I'm, this is a trade I'm not really worried. I don't lose sleep over. Like I have a lot of confidence in this trade. So I think the curve should steep it. Having said that, it's a bit crowded. It is a bit crowded. Uh, there's a lot of people in this trade, so. I agree. I agree. And it's a, it's a problem. And and I saw the other day, I'm with you, Jared, which is bad luck for you because I, you know, things aren't going well these days for me with that. I'm a little bit of a bond bear. But anyways, Jared, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you for your time. Um, why don't you just give people one last time where they can contact you, where they can find your, your daily dirt nap and uh, give everyone kind of the, your, your coordinates before we wrap up. Yeah, please uh, check out the newsletter, www.dailydirtnap.com, and you can follow me on Twitter at, uh, at Daily Dirt Nap, although sometimes I, I am a miserable bastard on Twitter, so just fair warning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go have your cigar. It was a pleasure chatting with you. Thanks a lot, Jared. It was been a pleasure talking. Thanks, Thanks. Jared. So, uh, Lena, get on here. That was uh, that was a good show, wasn't it, Lena? Mm-hmm. But let's yeah. talk about how, the how did you like that sour, by the way? Okay, okay, let's oh, start right. with the beer. We'll start with the beer. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, why don't you two tell me what you think of the sour, and then I'm going to follow up. I'm going to give it a 7.5, I, and I would buy it. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I thought you liked it a lot. You I, it it, I liked it. I mean, what, is a 7.5 bad? I'm, well, uh, you've look, been giving if, like uh, above yesterday. Yeah, oh, sorry, yeah, no, yesterday. Last week we had the Fantasy Factory, and I gave it a nine point one, right? Whatever I did, uh, I would buy a Fantasy Factory over this. But this is a good beer, and I'm gonna. I don't want to give it too high of a score, but I think seven and a half is a good score. I would say that you know, if I didn't like it, I'd be down under six. I liked okay. it. So, Lena, what do you think? I would give it a six point six. For the taste, Devil. if it was just for the cans, then I, I actually do appreciate all the artwork that's on um, their cans, which is great. It'd be nice to, uh, I would like to collect those empty cans. That's to say, but I'm not going to drink them. <laughs> okay, so I, ha I have a confession to make, guys. Oh, okay. how many, how many, how many episodes have we done, Patrick? This 39, is 39, right? so 39 episodes. Yeah, yeah, 39. In those 39 times, I have never not finished a beer. <gasps> yeah, you finished I, that one that one sour that was like that smaller can that was yeah. like it was a smaller can one and I got it down. It's the cement in the beer. This is so uh, you're not drunk you know, right now. 
No, so this is a market huddle first. I am not oh my gonna God. push the beer because it is undrinkable. And in, not in light of negative you. rates in Europe, you know what? I see. I, are, I see that the negative the sponsors rates in Europe are going to be pissed. Yeah, dude. they will be pissed. I understand. But in negative rates in Europe, I see that the ten-year boon yield is minus fifty. <laughs> I am giving this a minus 0.5 because I view anything that is undrinkable needs to have negative rates. Oh my God. So, so first ever minus rating. That is, that is like this. I don't know how you got this down, Patrick. This is just, and Lena, this just Well, it's, it's, it's a sour and hop, like it's sour and hoppy, right? Yeah, so. well, it's delicious. Just awful. Just terrible. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I had a I just feeling you wouldn't like it anyway. Yeah, but, no, I just, yeah. it's, I can't, I can't get it. There you go. It's so bad. There you go. Let's talk about uh, the picture. Yeah, yeah, Lena, what did you think of it? It's perfect. For a second, I was just like, "What? What are these pictures?" I, like, I thought it was all three of them with Kevin and uh, this gentleman, John Snow. John and then Snow, I realized okay. that a couple of the other pictures were actually from Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> so it's quite perfect. So, yeah. So one of our huddlers uh, there, uh, Chris, actually, sorry, John. We'll call him John. Um, yeah, John Snow. John Snow. Uh, you know, we had an opportunity to have beers with him, right? See, a lot of people think it's all about uh, Kit Harrington, but Kit Harrington is just the actor who played Jon Snow. But we were actually drinking with Jon Snow himself, yeah. right? So, uh, everyone just mixes up the actor with the main the main character, right? And, that's right. Uh, so and someone, so, one of our one of our viewers or listeners actually <laughs> recognized the fact YouTube, that yeah. that pointed it out that uh, I look a lot like uh, Yano somebody or other. Slint or something like that from from Game of Thrones. So when I heard this, I went to Google it to try to figure out what this guy looks like, and I and I Googled it, and, and sure enough, it's like an old, bald, fat <laughs> guy with a white beard. And and I'll tell you what the real problem here is, and this is a lesson for everyone. You know, Chris is a fairly good-looking guy to say the least. I think he's actually more handsome than Jon Snow, and. Uh, Never ever let your picture be taken beside someone that good looking. <laughs> that is the lesson. I could have told you that. You just like, you just don't go anywhere near him. Like, you know what? Like, thank God I'm married because if I, if he was my pal, we'd have to go out and like, like try to like pick up ladies. I would just, I would, I would be like, I'm not being friends with you. I'm not going anywhere near you. I'm, you go off, find somebody else to be your wingman because I don't want this at all. Well, I have a funny story about that then. Okay, okay go let's hear it. When I was in high school, you know, in that awkward teenage um, stage, and I had a few girlfriends, and, you know, we, we all had braces, we had glasses, we had freckles, whatever. It's just an awkward stage, right? So my mom once said, why, do you, why are you always with friends that are, let's say, how do I put this delicately, <laughs> that are not maybe, you know, the cream of the crop, so to speak, in looks? And I said, what are you talking about? They're my friends. And she said, is it is it to make yourself look better? <laughs> and I was like, what are you talking about? And you then I, ahead. years yeah, later, I, I realized, oh, I see. I, I yeah. see what she meant. Yeah. <laughs> you got to surround yourself with this. So don't ever do that. Now, Patrick did a great job putting together the pictures because it is actually pretty funny that I got beheaded in Game of Thrones. And it was yeah. from the fact that I kept arguing over and over again that fiscal spending would create inflation, which I deserve a, a beheading for that. <laughs> You're just early. You're going to be right. You're just going to be know, just but way I, too early. I have no, I, I'm early, but I have no head. No, exactly. <laughs> courtesy of Jon Snow, who lost money <laughs> betting uh, because you gave him some bad advice. <laughs> That's right. Jon Snow got upset because I told him to short the short long, <laughs> long bond. And, and then, th now this is you paying the price. <laughs> Lots of lessons here, folks. Number one, never let your, your picture be taken by somebody that is significantly better looking than you. Next thing you know, you'll be on the front cover of the market huddle and, and, and have an ax to your head. There you go. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, listen, it's a long weekend in Canada, right? Like, That's right. So, uh, so we, we recorded a little bit early. Uh, but yeah. uh, so we can wrap things up. But uh, we'll, we'll see. Like, there's um, we haven't recorded yet. But Trump's talking about some European tariffs this uh, afternoon. Is any the news hasn't come out? Is that I, you, I don't know. It could be like he's he's. It's been a few hours since he's put tariffs on anything. So I think it's time for him. To he's do overdue, else. right? Like yeah, uh, he's, yeah. It, it, you, every couple hours. Let me let me just actually look it up. Let me see. Like that's. 
so make when it when he app. when he sends out tweets, is it actually him tweeting it out as POTUS? Yeah, yeah for yeah. sure, because he misspells so, shit and stuff. <laughs> so so here. He does. Yeah, so it's at it, the, he, Trump speaking at 1:45 p.m. Eastern. Okay. And uh, and it's uh, the, uh, to make an announcement on EU trade. So that so we know there's some auto, yeah. auto, auto tariffs coming. Well, we'll find yeah. out. Obviously, we don't know. It could be. Okay, listen, I have to go because I got to go pour this thing down the sink. <laughs> <laughs> no huddle puddle. It's just going to be straight exactly. from the can to the sink. That's right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, have, have a good weekend, weekend everyone. Have a good weekend.